is on. Ci sono connessi. Ok. Chi sta? Fa lo zizzer, fa lo zizzer. Ah, ma io non vedo i nomi. Tempo del relatore. Allora, io non vedo i nomi di due, di due persone, vedo soltanto il nome di Federico Sabatini e di Enrico Borgogno Mondino. Poi gli altri me li dice come Fellow Gizier, quindi non sono gli altri relatori. Mi sentite? Pronto? Mi sentite? Sì, sì. Ah, ok. Lei è Beatrice Loi? Sì, sono io Beatrice di voi. Ok. Invece... Good morning, good morning. Quindi mancano praticamente parazzetti e cotia, sono gli altri. Siamo tutti italiani o... Siamo che tutti mi italiani. Sento, italiani. Ah, allora posso, ok. <ride> Sì, sì, no, perché sto parlando in italiano in questo momento? Perché sì, sì, no, perché mi andava via un attimo la connessione e quando sono tornato ho visto che parlava in italiano. Ok, ciao, sono Luigi Barazzetti, sono entrato adesso. Allora, buongiorno. buongiorno, io sono Alessandra Capito. Oh, ciao. Allora, se ci siamo tutti, vi do delle piccole istruzioni per come funzionerà, insomma, la sessione di oggi. Allora, in pratica, ogni presentazione dovrà essere di 8 minuti più ti faranno delle questioni, delle possibili domande. Ora mi dispiace, proprio io sarò molto uh, severa da questo punto di vista, perché gli organizzatori ISA ci hanno detto che dobbiamo fare molto stretti con i tempi, perché purtroppo uh, hanno ricevuto tanti, mh, tanti contributi, quindi hanno dovuto organizzare tante sessioni, quindi non possiamo sforare. Quindi, quando mancherà un minuto alla fine della vostra discussione, vi dirò ovviamente, vi segnalerò che manca un minuto, Mentre invece, se dovesse sperare, sarò costretta ad interrompervi. Ora, per poter uh, presentare, dovrete voi um, condividere il vostro schermo. Quindi siete voi che gestite la vostra presentazione tramite il vostro schermo. Ok. Uh, L'unica cosa che vi chiedo è di tenere i microfoni muti uh, se non state parlando e presentando, in modo tale da evitare i rumori di solito. Ah, se volete fare delle domande dovete utilizzare l'icona raise hand che è al, in basso in pratica quello con la manina 
e poi appena possibile vi darò la parola per fare le domande. Tanto credo che saremo solo noi. Enrico, non ti sentiamo. Non ti sento Enrico, cioè ti vedo ma non ti sento, non so se è solo un problema mio o anche gli altri. Eh, no, neanche io. No, allora io vedo che tu hai attivato il microfono, però continua a non sentirti. Dovresti provare a vedere sulla freccetta in basso vicino al microfono se, se la clicchi se ci hai impostato il microfono giusto. Perché puoi cambiare il microfono predefinito. sentite adesso? Sì, ora sì. sì, ora sì. Ok, sono uscito e rientrato. Non so cosa è successo. Ok, allora io direi di aspettare tre minuti e poi così con il fanno l'orario. Ok. Bene, buongiorno a tutti. Adesso che sono dotato di voce, posso salutare. <ride> Ne approfitto un secondo, posso? Mentre aspettiamo. Sì. Lo scambio che mi hai accennato ieri è, è in essere oppure perché dalla time table risulta ancora il vecchio no, scheduling? Praticamente la prossima ha detto: tanto è un programma che abbiamo fatto noi, uh, non lo comunichiamo mm -hmm. bene, no, dillo soltanto ai rispettivi, diciamo a tutte le persone, in modo tale che sono tutte avvisate, ma sulla time table lasciamo così sì che non abbiamo problemi. Quindi mi confermi che alle 10.10 c'è Sarvia, ok, perché faccio parlare lui, eh? quindi ci sarà lui. Sì, sì, okay. okay. sì, sì alle 10.10 c'è Sarvia e alle 11.10 c'è Pugliona. Benissimo, allora glielo confermo solo così... Ok. Ah, allora Enrico, ti posso dare un aggiornamento in tempo reale? La prof mm -hmm. mi ha detto che ho provato a parlare con Beniamino per fare lo spostamento su Stadia, ma al momento è molto impegnato e non ha ancora risposto, perciò si va tantissimo, risulta ancora così, non modificato. Ah, eh, di fatti, di fatti. Però appena possibile, insomma, la aggiorneranno. Però confermi, 10-10 Stadia. Sì, 10-10 okay. ok, perfetto. Ok, so, okay. good morning everyone, it's nine o'clock and let's start on time. My name is Alessandra Capulupo and I'm an assistant professor at the Politecnico di Bari. 
First of all, I would like to welcome you all here today. In this session, we will go over the innovative geomatics techniques for monitoring natural and artificial resources. To tackle the issues introduced by anthropogenic activities, natural disaster, and extreme weather. The session is composed by four interesting presentations. Before to go down to the business, just a few recommendations. To not bother with the noises the, uh, the speaker, please keep your microphone mute if you are not presenting or not talking. And if you want to ask a question, use the raise hand, raise hand icon. So uh, let's start. The first speech will be given by a researcher fellow from Polytechnic of Ibari, uh, Beatrice Lioi. She will be sharing with us uh, her study on the comparison of two methodologies for mapping fluid plan areas, uh, highlighting the relevance of digital terrain model based technologies. The title of her contribution is Coupled Use of Hydrological Hydraulic Model and Geomorphological Descriptor for Flood Prone Areas Evaluation, a case study of Lama Lama Sinata. That's the Torrioli, please. You should uh, turn on your microphone. Okay. Um, let me just the presentation more. Yes. Okay. Don't worry. We can wait. Mm. Oh, this is too long, too Okay, if you want, we can go ahead and we can, uh, and we can stop it. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. So, the next presentation is uh, uh, you from uh, um, Professor Barazzetti, researcher at Politecnico di Milano. Um, that presents a contribution to the creation of a predictive model able to minimize or reduce the hydrological hazard, especially before or during critical meteorological events. The title of this presentation is Combined Photogrammetric and Laser Scanning Survey to Support Fluvial Sediment Transport Analysis. Thus, I will ask you to give all your attention to Professor Barazzetti. Okay, thank you very much for the right. introduction. But, ah, okay. Okay. Um, just a confirmation if you can hear me and you can see my screen. Yes, we can hear you and we can see your screen. Okay, perfect. Um, so, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about um, um, a project that is related to uh, hydrogeological instability. That is uh, a problem that not only affects Italy, Europe, but the entire mm, world. Uh, here are some images of the area where uh, we work. That is at the north uh, of Lombardy in, uh, in Italy. And uh, the activities were carried out in the framework of a project called SmartSet that is uh, uh, related to the creation of a tool to predict uh, erosion in uh, basins. Um, this is our case study. It's the river that uh, crosses the city of Lecco, Caldone. 
Uh, it's a river that uh, was highly modified in the past, mainly for industrial purposes. Here you can see an image in the 70s and an image today. The, the river was completely buried with some artificial barriers and today it is as a significant impact, especially with the um, uh, frequent uh, rainfalls uh, that occur uh, of the, uh, in the areas and floods are not rare events. Uh, in this project, we have worked in two areas. Uh, one area is, uh, let's say, in a natural environment in the Alps. Uh, instead, the second area is a sedimentation basin uh, that is uh, at the entrance of the city. And the aim was to calculate the amount of um, uh, material transported by the river. Uh, and thematics uh, play a fundamental role because uh, the no knowledge of the morphology is necessary to run a numerical simulation. This is the first uh, area in the natural environment. We, were, we have worked in a, a section of the river about 120 meters long. Uh, in this area, previous work was done by placing some stones uh, colored by yellow and uh, tracking the movement of these stones uh, using uh, RFID sensors so monitoring the position of those stones at different epochs especially after uh, strong rainfalls uh, allowed us to uh, estimate the uh, the amount of uh, sediments that transported sediments by by the river and to run uh, a mathematical model we needed to know the morphology of, of the area and uh, geomatics uh, was the solution used to measure, um, to create a digital terrain model with a combination of multiple techniques because one single technique was not sufficient. I will be just give a very short presentation, GNSS uh, uh, was used for uh, georeferencing the projects through some points uh, measure uh, some targets measure on the ground then uh, points in the water inside the riverbed were measured with a total station just an, an operator with a pole it's an area with shallow water so it was possible for an operator to enter directly into the water we have also some points measured with the laser scanner let's say the area and uh, not covered by water and the last part uh, for the Overall area, we used a drone. It was necessary to combine both laser scanning and drone because uh, um, some parts were completely covered by vegetation and so they were not visible in drone images. So in the end, we have a point from three methods, total station, terrestrial laser scanning and the drone. They were combined and in this way we were able to create a very uh, high resolution digital uh, terrain model of the riverbed it's 0.25 meters this is much higher than uh, normal uh, digital terrain models available in cartographic repositories in the second area in the second area the aim was the same was the re reconstruction of a digital terrain model but this is a sediment pool where the level of water is much higher. Uh, these are just two images of the same pool uh, in 2007-2010. As you can see, just after three years, the pool is completely filled uh, with debris. Um, this means uh, that uh, uh, we need some way to clean the pool and we need to uh, a way to understand how the pool is uh, uh, field. Uh, in this way, we can plan uh, the acquisition, uh, the, um, the cleaning, and uh, uh, let's say avoid the risk of floods. Uh, to accomplish this task, we had to find an alternative solution because the operator couldn't go inside the pool. With the pool, the level of the water is much higher. So we developed a low-cost uh, drone. Uh, the the solution. The solution chosen is a ultrasonic sensor, very low cost, less than 300 euro, that can be placed on a drone, and then uh, the drone uh, can move on uh, on the water. And at the same time, a total station is tracking the drone. Total station and the ultrasonic sensor are synchronized, so we know the position. Uh, of the drone, we know the depth measure in that point, and we can calculate uh, 
uh, three dimensional coordinates. This is just an example of a data acquisition scheme. Uh, here you can see the different strips done with the drone. These other parts are instead some manually measure points in areas where uh, an operator could simply, could simply walk. I just show you an example of the result after one year. This is between October 2016 and 17. Uh, in just one year, the amount of debris increased uh, of about 1,000 cubic meters. That is, uh, that is a lot for the considered uh, river. Uh, the, the last part I'm going to talk is uh, the development of a data sharing platform because one of the limitations that we have found in this project is that the people in charge of the numerical models, they are expert in uh, hydraulics, uh, uh, geology, but um, sometimes they don't have a strong background in uh, cartography. And, uh, uh, cartographic data are necessary to, for this kind of analysis, uh, maps, orthophotos, land use, and these data, some of them are uh, available as open source data, but they have some issues like different reference systems. Um, we decided to implement uh, a platform that is on, online now and it is based on the Get It uh, open source software that allows uh, uh, people interested in numerical simulation of for uh, sediment transportation analysis to get um, cartographic data already harmonized. It is sufficient to go on the uh, website to type the name of the river and then you get the, um, the different uh, sources available just in already in the format uh, so they can be directly used uh, in a numerical model at the moment this was done just for this river but the idea is to extend uh, the work uh, at the regional level and uh, of course if, if we can continue to uh, work in other areas so to conclude uh, i presented uh, a project with different applications at the same time in which different uh, geomatics tools like uh, GIS system, total station, GNSS, etc. They were uh, all necessary. Um, at the moment, the monitoring campaign is in progress. We have three, three epochs, uh, but we would like to change our schedule so to have the opportunity to go and to measure directly after major meteorological events. We would like also to extend this uh, to other um, areas and to adapt the uh, repository that we have created uh, so that the persons involved in this kind of applications in a specific area can directly access the data. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope to be on time. Yes, thank you, you, you were on time. So any question to Professor Barazzetti? Uh, I have a question, please, um, for all the present. Please, could you write your name and surname uh, on your profile? Because otherwise I cannot read your name and uh, if you want to ask something, I don't know who you are. So, uh, if we don't have questions at the moment, I have a curiosity. Uh, um, because the project that you share with us is really interesting and uh, I would like to know if, uh, if you have planned already uh, some future developments. You want to study other areas or do you want to uh, apply uh, other methodologies? Uh, that, that is the idea. So the idea is to continue working on this area because uh, uh, now we have uh, three years of data, but this is still, uh, we still need to continue and uh, especially to be able to correlate our information to uh, the meteorological events. Three years are not sufficient. We would like to extend this also at European level, but at the moment uh, we are still working on that. Uh, for instance, the platform is, uh, a, uh, we already added uh, uh, like a kind of uh, dictionary, a multi-language support, so that um, people can uh, access information in a specific language and the semantic broker available is, uh, can look for synonyms, but uh, as mentioned, <laughs> we need to get uh, some funds to continue at, at, uh, our, in a wider area. 
Thank you very much, Professor Barazzetti. So, the next presentation is due by uh, Dr. Fotia, uh, a PhD candidate from the Mediterranean University of Reggio Calabria that uh, presents a contribution titled Road Infrastructure Monitoring, Monitoring an Experimental Geomatic Integrated System. Please. Mm, Dr. Fatia, you should, uh, uh, you can introduce your presentation. Hi, I am uh, Ernesto Bernardo. I present the presentation of uh, Dr. Fatia, ah. but I, I brought them uh, share, um, the screen. Um, um, if uh, you can help me. <clears throat> if the share button is not active, it's because you have to click on the on the little screen that you see. Uh, that's uh, what I was looking for after I had the I, same problem. I don't see the button. It's on the left bottom. Left side at the bottom. Yeah. Is the square the first square you see the Close to the hand. Okay. No. I mean, you have a gain. Sorry. Yeah. Did you see it? Uh, it's on the bottom left side. Uh, can you see the hand, the hand icon, the chat icon? The chat icon, yes, and... Uh, icon on the left, and on the left there is a share screen. How many icon do you have? No. I have three icons. No, I have two icons. Uh, okay. uh, uh, I try to ask to the same. The hand and the um, chat. Okay. Uh, Alessandra, I think uh, we can go with uh, another. The uh, next one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I try to ask. Uh, Sorry. Okay, don't worry, don't worry. So, um, the next presentation is due by uh, Professor Borgogno Montino. We are really pleased to have you here. Uh, professor of the University of Turin, which will propose an innovative group of procedures to model territorial dynamics. The title of this is uh, The Software Tools in Support of Urban Planning, the Possible Role of Historical Maps in Programming Sustainable Future for Cities. Yeah, I'm trying to, to, to share my screen, but uh, the button is there. I click on it, but uh, it doesn't open any menu to uh, point to any window. Uh, you have to click on the screen that appears in the middle of the screen. In the middle of the screen. No, when you click the button on the left, it appears a new window. So you have to click inside that window. Yeah, I saw before, but now it doesn't work anymore. No. Okay. I, I can't see anything there. Uh, maybe try to refresh uh, the, the browser. Yeah, I try. Okay. Yeah, let's try to... Okay, I had. Okay, um, so uh, should be the this one. Okay, here is it. Can you see it? Can you see? Yes. Yes. Yes, we see it. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to uh, show you uh, a work uh, which tried to present a new procedure or, uh, for uh, reading and representing urban expansion dynamics uh, in a very urban context. Uh, the aim is to represent the urban growth the dynamics uh, and uh, simulating them to a force balance where urban growth pushes against rural natural areas, making desirable external landscape preservation. 
The way trying to uh, with this task is to uh, develop a just based procedure in uh, showing two situations, one in the 80th uh, century, in the 18th century, and one uh, referring to the 2000 uh, uh, years, so recent year. So uh, we compare these two situations using both historical and modern maps uh, in order to represent the so called field of forces, uh, intending this as uh, pushes from, of urban against rural, and uh, try to quantify that, uh, uh, involved players. That we can uh, recognize in those exposed to the threat, like the natural and rural surroundings uh, of urban areas that try to put outside, and the other ones are three and one, that is the built area are, with, with, with menace, the other one. So uh, the study area is located uh, in the first belt of uh, Torino, northwestern Italy, and it includes the municipalities of Colegno and Grugliasco for about uh, 32 square kilometers and uh, 80,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, it hosts historical and valuable farmhouses and agricultural pertinences uh, that are nowadays mainly disused. Around the middle of the 20th century, local industries and automotive factories, including Farina, Bertona, Fiat, and Westinghouse determined radical changes uh, in, in the area that deeply modified the original rural landscape. So the available data we had were an historical maps from the 1830s, <coughs> which is called the uh, map of the Statisar di, uh, di Terraferma, and uh, the, scale, the reference scale is 1 to 50,000, and uh, it is, was generated in a sinusoidal project projection. It uh, reports continental states uh, of the Savoy Italian royal family. And uh, on the other side, we have a recent uh, technical map, uh, 1 to 50,000 to be consistent with the previous one, which is dated uh, 2000. And the reference frame is a modern one, which is uh, the UTN 32 North uh, WGS 84. So, of course, for uh, the map, uh, the historical map, we need to georeference it, and we did with a sufficient number of ground control points, reaching uh, the results you can say there. The final result was uh, raster maps uh, for, of the historical scanned image uh, having a 5 meter resolution and a planimetric error of 22.1 meters. So, after doing that, we uh, interpret the two maps and we edit, uh, vectorize uh, some classes that we retain important for landscape analysis. And, uh, you can find them there. We divide it in urban threats and landscape exposed values. So we have some classes that represent some menace for the other uh, classes and some that uh, represent the threatened uh, resources. So you can find here the very different situation that occurred in the two different periods. In the left side, the 80s map and 18th century map, and uh, on the right side, the 2000 map. So it's very, very uh, different. After doing that, uh, uh, we built called the Urban Density Map, and uh, this was obtained uh, rasterizing urban classes with um, GSD of 10 meters, and uh, we coded all classes that represent built areas with digital number equal one. And then a sliding window approach was uh, operated to somehow map the urban density map according to uh, the formula reported at the bottom of the page. So the representation was a raster map of density. And after doing that, uh, this new raster map of density, uh, urban density was uh, interpret as a topographic surface, like a DSM, let me say, and the slope and the aspect maps were computed. The slope was interpreted as, a, as a, the strength of the pushing forces of urban against rural, and the aspect was interpreted like the direction of pushes. So slope and aspect, the rest of the maps were converted back to points and their values archived as fields into the attribute table. So, using a QGIS function, a field of vector was finally represented for both the periods, and uh, <coughs> you can see these results in the um, green and red arrows in the map show there. So, this is how the landscape changes in uh, during the two periods. 
after doing that, we try to qualify the area from both uh, the uh, pushing forces point of view and from the threatened classes. So we built, we defined the so-called local pressure index. Uh, and um, just a minute because, okay. <clears throat> A local pressure uh, index uh, that of urban into rural, and uh, it was defined according to the formula you can see there. And the result is presented for one of the periods in uh, in the right side of this image. Uh, this uh, index uh, um, was built under the hypothesis that the contribution of the impacting factor decreases while increasing the distance from the nearest impacting feature and its initial and maximum value is the one corresponding to the weight of the nearest feature. Moreover, we built another spatially distributed index which we call, that we call the local impact index that uh, responds to the formula you can see there and that uh, somehow represents the quality resistance of uh, threatened uh, classes. After doing that, we compare the two situations, and uh, you can see here the two situations for the two periods we compared, and uh, in uh, the local pressure index, uh, highest values represent urban and peri-urban areas where urban pressures are stronger. Instead, uh, interpreting the, the um, local impact index, uh, <coughs> lower values represent areas where the, the environmental landscape quality is lower. So. Looking at these two situations, we can decide and interpret the dynamics that suffered, or sorry, that interested the area during the reference period we, we analyzed. Conclusions uh, were uh, the proposed methodology was based on space dependent indices uh, uh, that uh, specifically design, um, were designed to locally measure landscape factor retained in both the urban growing processes. Urban density maps were considered as the starting point to derive information from about strength, strength and direction of pushes at the single time. Mapping the importance of built-up areas and agricultural natural areas, uh, we measured the chance of advancing for urban classes or resisting from the point of view of rural classes. And this interpretation can give an interesting uh, reading of uh, per urban landscape dynamics uh, uh, in the area. Two space dependence indices, LPI and LII, were proposed to map at a single time these peculiarities and, and helping the interpretation. What is very uh, useful for, in our opinion, is that uh, this approach that concerns uh, us, okay, we have just finished. This, uh, the, the true interesting step is that uh, this uh, example I did that uh, uh, represent two past situations can be used also for uh, simulate future possible expansion um, ideas for administration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Mandino. Any questions? Remember that if you want to ask a question, you have to click on the right hand button that is on the bottom of your screen. Okay, I don't see any answer. I have a curiosity um, regarding the slide seven, because uh, I saw that you are seeing some arbitrary uh, weights. So I want to know if your method is uh, dependent from some weights, if you have to perform the sensitive, um, um, a sensitive analysis to understand if your model is dependent from them or not. Okay, uh, the weights were arbitrarily uh, assigned, so that they are strictly dependent on uh, the skills of a planner. So there is a remaining subjective part of the method that must be managed by uh, the planners themselves. So we have not done any uh, sensitivity analysis, uh, but uh, we have just built uh, and proposed some index that can be uh, support the interpretation of past policies and urban uh, expansion uh, policies and uh, can be, that can be used for future planning in order to compare present situation with future programmed one. Anyway, a very high part of subjective uh, of subjectivity 
still remains in the assignation mainly of the weights to the classes. Okay, thank you very much. If nobody has uh, something to add, we can go to the next presentation. I hope that uh, Ernesto Bernardo solved this problem with the sharing of the screen. Is it okay now? Uh, yes, uh, hello everybody. I'm Ernesto uh, Bernardo, a PhD student. Uh, I am a co-author. Uh, I bring uh, greetings uh, from uh, the other uh, co-author and uh, I show uh, the presentation. No, maybe... <laughs> No, maybe we have uh, some technical problems. So this is the turn of uh, Lioi. <laughs> I hope that he said she <laughs> solved the problem with uh, her laptop. So are you able to share your screen? Okay. No? Okay. Uh, wait, because we are not seeing your screen. We are hearing you, but we don't see your screen. Are you about technical problems? Okay. Mm, but I'm not understanding if you are not able to share or we just we don't see your screen. Sorry, but the Mac is a very problem uh, for personal computer. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Not able to share my. You are not able to share your screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we can go ahead with uh, Ernesto Bernardo. Please, oh. continue your presentation. Road infrastructure monitoring and experimental geomatic integrated system. Uh, uh, sorry, the... sorry, we are not seeing your presentation. We are just seeing you. Okay. You look? Yes, now yes. Now it's okay. okay. Rod infrastructure monitoring and experimental geomatic integrated system. This study describes uh, an uh, experimental integrated sensor network, network system uh, based on long term uh, monitoring in uh, real time while an adaptive uh, neurofuzzy system is used uh, to predict the, the formation of GPS bridge uh, monitoring points. The proposed system integrates different data and then uh, it works them through machine learning techniques uh, in order to train uh, the neural network in a such uh, a way that uh, once the sensor send uh, uh, the monitored uh, parameters as input data, it can uh, return an uh, alert signal. The predictive system uh, therefore allows to know uh, the structural uh, behavior following only the measurement of the displacements. Uh, it is therefore capable of uh, sending an alert signal uh, with a respective risk class. Figure 9 shows uh, how the proposed system works. Um, the case study is a uh, road bridge in Reggio Calabria uh, between Palmi and Gioia Tauro in uh, South Italy. A long term structural monitoring uh, system has been installed on the bridge uh, to monitor its performance. The system has uh, sensor GPS and or accelerometric uh, modules useful to measure uh, the vertical and horizontal vibration and displacements. Uh, in the specific case, <coughs> only the data obtained from GPS units installed uh, to monitor the bridge deck 
uh, movements in three direction were used and compared uh, with those uh, obtained from uh, accelerometers. Uh, the uh, 12 uh, receivers are installed on the road in correspondence of the pier and in the middle uh, of the span uh, and uh, on some no external points uh, near the infrastructure to measure the displacement. These parameters uh, were used to recreate the condition uh, in the various scenarios required uh, for neural network training. Uh, in order to identify the geometric uh, features of the structure, a uh, UAV survey was carried out. They used the DJI uh, Phantom uh, 4 Pro. The processing of uh, 3D model construction uh, used for the exact uh, geometry includes uh, uh, four, uh, four uh, standard main steps. Uh, once uh, the model was obtained, uh, the geometry was extrapolated. Uh, the characteristics uh, are shown in uh, Table 2. Uh, therefore, uh, the infrastructure model was built. Uh, on uh, it, we added the established roads and the failures detected. Uh, from the structural model, uh, given the particular position of the building, it has been uh, verified uh, that the field span uh, is uh, the span subject uh, to greater stress. Uh, for risk uh, classes have been identified according to the various software processes. Uh, class A, uh, negligible, negligible, negligible. Uh, class B, low, class C, uh, moderate, class D, high. The real neural network was trained uh, as uh, follows, uh, implemented uh, 800 uh, scenarios. The neural network used the back propagation algorithm that work in uh, two phases, an initial phase and uh, a feedback phase. In the first phase, we have to enter the uh, displacement uh, X value that are obtained from the structural model. To calculate the correct output value Y, uh, displacements and the risk class. The second phase of propagation of the uh, backworks uh, allows uh, to calculate error signal uh, between the desired output D and the Y obtained and then uh, propagated uh, appropriately from the output layer uh, to the input site state. In order to update the values of the weights uh, and uh, bases uh, to manage uh, the output data, we use the. Uh, Just one minute more. Just one minute. The, we use the control unit, in particular the process and the signal is sent through the communication channel to a data system. It records the data and uh, compares signal with the previous ones. Uh, if there uh, are any changes, it uh, informs the operator of possible increases of the structure or simply change of risk class. Um, our integrated prediction system shows the displacement value measured uh, by the sensor and the disk class calculated by the neural network. The result uh, attests the good uh, adaptability of the model uh, to the real state, state with an uh, average error of about 10%. Um, the test carried out with a neural network on a model return at a correspondence of 19%, uh, indicating a good uh, adaptability and uh, functioning of the system. Um, thank you for uh, your attention. <laughs> thank you very much. Any question? Okay. So. I would like to ask a question to you, because uh, if I understood uh, correctly, when you benchmarked your model, you got in troubles. So to go beyond these limits, how do you think to validate your model? And uh, do you want to explore more real cases? Um, um, you, no, about this uh, structure, uh, I, we don't... Uh, we don't uh, uh, consider him uh, uh, any crisis, but um, in future uh, um, we experiment um, um, any 
um, any any risk. Okay. All the risk. Sorry, <laughs> my English is oh, very bad. <laughs> don't worry. Okay, thank you very much for sharing with us your contribution. Now, uh, it's the turn to Lioi. I hope that she solved all the technical problems that she had. And the title of uh, our contribution is uh, Coupled Issues of Hydrological, Hydrologic Hydraulical Model and Geomorphological Descriptor for Flood Plan Areas Evaluation, a case study of Lama, Lama Signata. Dr. Rioi, are you here? <laughs> okay. Okay, wait a moment. Wait, 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 wait a moment. Uh, because uh, um, maybe you have a problem with uh, your connection. Because uh, we see that you are uh, sharing your screen, but we don't see your slides and you are not uh, in uh, presentation mode. So, please, <laughs> active the presentation mode, first of all. And uh, I don't know, but we don't see your slides. Okay. Uh, if you have a problem with your condition, we can solve in another mod in another uh, mode. I have your presentation, so if you want, I can uh, uh, show your presentation and uh, you can talk um, seeing my screen. What do you think about? I think the sensibility of the microphone is too low. Oh, okay. Okay, so you are seeing your slides. You should turn on the presentation mode. Otherwise, we'll see your comment. You can press F5, usually. Or otherwise, you can go on the bottom and see. Uh, and there is uh, um, and the last icon before the, the Zoom. Uh, the lighter. We don't hear you. I know that you are talking because sometimes uh, I'm able to cut just some words, but I don't hear you. I'm not understanding what no. you are saying. I, I, I'm not hearing, I'm sorry. I don't know if the other can hear you, but uh, I cannot. No, 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 doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> So I'm not able to help you because I don't know what it is your problem. Try to turn off your microphone, microphone a later to activate again. Maybe we can gain something.
Uh, I have a question. Do you have another connection? Lioi, do you have another connection? Maybe you could use your smartphone as hotspot. Or uh, you could do a refresh of your uh, laptop. Maybe you can go out and uh, go in again. Okay. So I know that now Lioi is not with us. So with us. Okay. Hi, Vincenzo. Hi, Alessandro. Do you have another connection? Maybe you could use your smartphone as a spot. So, Alessandro, I'm sorry, could you see my screen? Yes, now I can hear you actually. Uh, going in. Okay, so now you can hear and can you see my screen shared? Yes, now I can see your screen and I can hear you. Okay, so now just, just a moment, just a moment. <laughs> Thank you, Vincent. So I know that now you I think I think we are now. Yes, now I can hear you. Yes, now I can see your screen and I can hear Okay, let's start. Good morning, everyone. Apologize for technical problems. I'm a research fellow at Politecnico di Bari in uh, Southern Italy. It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, our work called Couple Views of uh, Hydrologic Hydraulic Model and Geomorphological Descriptors for Flood Prone Areas Evaluation, a case study of Lama Lama Sinata. I would like to thank and mention my co authors. Andrea Gioia, Vincenzo Totaro, Gabriella Balacco, Vito Iacobellis, and Giancarlo Chiaia. The topic of this work is the evaluation of flood-prone areas in karst ephemeral streams, typical in Puglia region. In the last decade, floods impact increased dramatically in many regions of the world, requiring a proper understanding of interactions between physical and social processes. The delineation of flood risk maps is a fundamental step in planning urban areas management. This evaluation can be carried out by hydraulic hydrologic modeling that allows obtain water depth and related flooded areas. This study is focused on Lama Lama Sinata, a karst ephemeral stream that flows throughout the metropolitan area of Bari. The main characteristics of this catchment are list. In this work, uh, we have used two methodology. The first is the hydrologic hydraulic model, and the second is the geomorphological descriptors. In this work, the hydraulic simulation was carried out using a two-dimensional flow to the software, which provides flood prone areas delineation, starting from flood hydrographs obtained for fixed return periods. 13 years and 200 years. The steps for the building of this model are importing the digital terrain model DTM with resolution 8 meters, the grid with resolution 10 meters, inflow condition throat hydrograph and progress coefficient um, following uh, Manning theory. The second uh, methodology uh, that we used is geomorphological descriptors, which represent promising tools for a rapid assessment of flood prone areas. They exploit morphological features of floodplains, providing a quantitative measure for a preliminary detection of areas exposed to flood hazards. The, um, these, uh, these descriptors can be split into categories, synthetic and composite. The most important of uh, these uh, descriptors are difference in elevation age and geomorphic flood index, also known GFA. The physical meaning of uh, these descriptors are shown in these uh, figures. 
Um, these, uh, these descriptors were developed by Salvatore Manfreda at the uh, University of um, Basilicata. For flood mapping, uh, these indices uh, uh, need a calibration procedure. First of all, they need the reference map obtained by hydraulic hydrologic model, as you saw in uh, the pre previous slide. The map of these indices were scaled from minus one to one. And then we applied a moving threshold, which allow the classification in true positive, false positive, true negative, and false negative. In this way, uh, we build a, a, an error function called objective function. The optimal uh, uh, value of uh, this threshold is that corresponding of the minimum objective function. Furthermore, uh, we applied the rock curve. Let's move to the results sections. In this slide, uh, you can see the results of hydraulic hydrologic model where the colors correspond to the different maximum flow depth. On the right, uh, you can see the transversal section of the Lama Lama Sinata and, they, and uh, the maximum flow depth. The results of uh, ge uh, geomorphological descriptors are shown in this table. The best performing indices are H and GFA. This is confirmed also by the rock curve. In this picture, uh, you can see the flood inundation map obtained by uh, the, descriptor, the descriptor H, the descriptor GFA, and the flooded area obtained by hydraulic hydrologic simulation, uh, the um, reference map. For the sake of clarity, I show only the results of 30 years uh, return period. These results are uh, perfectly coherent uh, with the particular nature of lame, generally characterized by a pseudo-regular rectangular section. A comparison with uh, other studies on uh, similar areas, uh, such as Lama Balice, Lama Picone, Lama Cupa and Lama, Lama Sinata. Results are pretty similar. H is uh, confirmed to be the best uh, geomorphological uh, descriptors. It should be noted that the TM resolution are different. The highest uh, resolution... Just one minute more. Perfect. Just one minute more. Um, so, as final remarks, the outcomes of this paper provide a contribution in the field of flood prone area delineation, highlighting that the use of geomorphic methods at the expense of their conceptual simplicity could, could give relevant information about the susceptibility of areas to flooding. The implementation of this kind of methodology could lead to an improvement in the updating of flood risk maps in order to give new tools to practitioners and public authorities for a more error management of risk. At the base of both the approach, the DTM is required as the fundamental element, the resolution of which strongly influences the accuracy of uh, results. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Bioi. Uh, any question? If you have any question, you can press the end raise uh, icon on the bottom of your screen. In the meantime, I have a curiosity. I would like to know if you have benchmarked your the method that you propose uh, against past events occurred in that area. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Uh, my research group uh, are, uh, apply uh, this model also to endorheic uh, basin, typical in the uh, southern Puglia uh, region with good uh, results. Uh, this line of research aims to have a faster and more efficient mapping of hydraulic uh, risk at large uh, application uh, scale. Thank, Thank you. So, if we no one has uh, any other questions. 
Okay, if one has an error. Okay, so with some difficulties, we arrived at the end of this session. Thank you very much for all for attending, and thanks to the author for sharing with us your interesting contribution. I wish you a nice pizza conference. Enjoy. Bye. Thank you very much. See you, Alessandra. Thank you. See you, Sandra. Yes. Hi, Sandra. Sí. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, did you read the message uh, with the link uh, in chat? Uh, no. Which message? Uh, I tried to resend. Try to resend? No, I tried to resend the message. Ah, okay. No, because I didn't have to do it. Okay, now yes. Ah, okay, yes, thank you. Sandra, è conclusa? Iniziamo la, la successiva, comincio a organizzare la successiva. Sì, sì, ho concluso, però devo mh, compilare un modulo, per questo sto ancora è disponibile, qua. È disponibile, il modulo di valutazione. È disponibile da qua quel modulo? No, in pratica... Eh, lo mando io in privato uh, alle share. Eh, esatto, sì, sì, sì. È arrivato via mail. Anche. Dovrebbe essere arrivato, però tanto ce l'ho io sotto mano, posso mandarlo senza problemi. Ah, ok, va bene. Okay. Lo mando anche a lei, allora. Oh, Grazie, per la sono successiva. So, in the meantime, I'm trying to uh, organize the next uh, session. I'm uh, Rico Borgogno, uh, and I'm the chair of the next session in this room. And... Uh, um, I try to check for the presence of all the authors that are scheduled. There is a um, little change in the schedulation. In fact, the second talk from uh, Angela Gorgoglione, Alberto Castro, Andrea Gioia, and Vito Iacobellis uh, is moved to the next session and is programmed at uh, 11.10 and will be managed by another chair, which is uh, Marco Scaglioni, Professor Marco Scaglioni. So, uh, in place of this moved talk, another one, which is from uh, Filippo Sarvia, and uh, uh, I will present later. So, we have uh, one, two, three, four intervention. I <coughs> check for the authors, so for the first, Federico Sonnessa should be the talker, the, the, the speaker. Is yes. Right? Can you okay, hear me? You're present. Okay. Great. Uh, for the second one, uh, uh, Filippo Sarvia is present. Yes, I am. Okay. Great. Uh, and then the third third one is Mirko Saponaro, should be the, uh, the speaker. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Ciao, Mirko. And uh, for the last one, I don't know if it's Fotia or again Ernesto Bernardo for the next presentation, for the last one. Which is one? Ernesto Bernardo. Okay, I confirm. Okay, Ernesto Bernardo, you're welcome again for this presentation. Great. So you are all, all here. Is, uh, is two minutes at the starting point, which is 10 o'clock. So uh, we are perfectly in time. Okay. Okay. So, just let me open the right window. Here is it. Okay. So, welcome everybody. As I told you, I'm Enrico Borgogno. I'm an associate professor by the Department of Agriculture, Forest and Food Sciences by University of Torino. I'm uh, involved in geomatics in general. And I will be the, have the pleasure to be the chair of this session. And... Uh, uh, it will be quite interesting for us. It's quite a difference in terms of contents, I see. But then for this reason, I expect to be very stimulating for people attending it. Okay? So basically, um, 
we have intervention concerning um, indoor positioning methods, so very close range uh, application of geometrics. Uh, and uh, then we have some uh, concerns about uh, remote sensing for uh, estimate of damages from hailstorms on a completely different scale of uh, analysis. Then we have uh, photogrammetric uh, uh, devoted presentation uh, dealing with the UAB acquisition. And finally, we have a road cadastre uh, intervention from uh, Ernesto Bernardo. Okay, so we have very, very different items that we, we can discuss about. Okay, let's, uh, we, can, uh, we can start. We are perfect in time, it's 10 o'clock, so we can, I invite the first uh, speaker, which is uh, Alberico Sonessa, which is uh, an assistant professor by the Polytechnic of Bari, if I am correct, and uh, yes. he will present uh, um, a work uh, about indoor positioning methods, a short review and first test, using a robotic platform for tunnel monitoring, okay? So please, uh, Alberico, we are here to hear uh, for you. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you, Professor. Uh, I'm Alberico Sonnessa from uh, Politecnico di Bari. First of all, I want to thank you all uh, my coator, Mirko Saponaro, Vincenzo Saverio Alfio, Alessandra Capoluco, Ad Adriano Turso, and uh, Euphemia Tarantino. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, an experience of indoor positioning for uh, tunnel monitoring. Let's start from uh, the problem. Which is the problem? Outdoor, everything is simple because we can uh, obtain uh, 3D maps, very detailed 3D maps with high precision mapping, uh, mapping techniques. And uh, we can locate ourselves uh, easily with, uh, let's say, with our mobile phone, of course, or uh, with the high precision GNSS uh, receivers. But at, at indoors, everything is, uh, is difficult because at indoors, GNSS signal is very, very weak, is inadequate for many purposes. Uh, so, simultaneous localization and mapping, so-called SLAM, that is the estimation of the location of a sensor, and the simultaneous um, building, mapping of uh, the environment uh, observed by the sensor, it is still uh, an open issue, an interesting issue. Uh, indoor positioning is uh, very important in many fields of uh, engineer, civil engineering, in underground, uh, mainly in underground uh, construction, let's say in uh, excavation and tunneling, in tunnel and monitoring and modeling, and, uh, in mining. Close the microphone, everybody close the microphone, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, what I'm going to show you is uh, our preliminary results of in, an industrial application in the field of civil engineering. Uh, this application has been developed by CIPAL company and coordinated by the research group uh, of the Politecnico di Bari, the Applied Geomatics Laboratory, within the project co-funded uh, between uh, European Union and the uh, Puglia region. And this project is aimed at exploring the opportunity to deploy unmanned ground vehicle for tunnel monitoring purposes. Okay, as you can see from, uh, from this table, uh, in underground construction, uh, there are many, many requirements. First of all, uh, when we talk about monitoring or uh, monitoring of deformation, we need accuracy. So we need an accuracy around uh, millimeters. And uh, at the same time, the employed um, sensors must be, let's say, construction site proof. They must resist against dust, against uh, emission caused by construction machine, against vibration. So there are, uh, as you can see in this table, many, many uh, indoor positioning methods. But since uh, we don't have no time to describe every, every method, I'm going to talk about the methods we employed in our experience, that is, Polar systems. Polar systems mainly measure the position of points by using distances and angles. And the reverse, 
if we measure the position of known points, we can retrieve the position of the sensor. So we can uh, locate the sensor inside an environment uh, at indoor. Uh, most widely known polar systems are of course total station and laser scanner everyone uh, in, the, in the geomatic field of course known uh, those instruments and uh, they are very suited for civil engineering application because these sensors are born to work in a construction site so they are rugged they are very accurate and just to go ahead uh, these are uh, our needs in uh, our experience. The estimation of the over and under excavated section of the tunnel with respect uh, to a type section, of course. The survey of the, of, uh, the excavation uh, head during the turning works, just to avoid the, um, the fall down of the, of the excavation head, and the automatic identification of the under and uh, excavated areas. Uh, uh, to reach okay because when you uh, build a tunnel uh, you have to reach the minimum theoretical tunnel section so you need to verify during the excavation and this is our baby it's called the uh, bulldog this is uh, uh, made by uh, an unmanned ground vehicle uh, this is the, the green one with the with the wheels uh, embedded with the Trimble S610 scanning station, it is this is an hybrid uh, total station, uh, half total station, half laser scanner, of course, and uh, a, a geo laser automatic tripod. This is for the automatic uh, leveling of the surveying instrument. This configuration uh, is um, very easy to upgrade and uh, from uh, the hardware site and also both from the hardware site and the software site side. Okay, at this stage of development, uh, Bulldog is not autonomous. I, I, I told you it, this is a baby, so it is not autonomous. At this stage of development, it must be dry, uh, driven toward the target area. Then he uh, measures the position of uh, some retro reflective uh, prisms of no location in the tunnel. It performs a scan in the uh, working in laser scanner mode. And then the acquired data are processed and analyzed using, uh, using a specific tool developed by, by CIPAL and NAS. Uh, so uh, by using this tool, we can extract, of course, 3D model, uh, cross-section, uh, volumes under excavated areas, over excavated area, uh, areas, and uh, so on. This is the first stage of development. And in the next uh, steps, uh, we want to implement a full slam algorithm. So uh, in order to make uh, this platform, to make, to make a bulldog capable, capable of autonomously detect obstacles and move inside the, the construction, uh, construction site. Uh, so a laser scanner and uh, a inertial uh, platform will be integrated in, uh, in bulldog. Uh, but now we are testing uh, SLAM algorithms. One minute on, uh, remaining. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, SLAM algorithms on uh, using uh, this uh, prototype, this uh, platform, this robotic uh, platform. Okay. Just uh, conclusive remarks. Uh, so, in the field of civil engineering, uh, accurate P, uh, of course, is required in many in many applications. Uh, the integration of IP techniques in the in this platform represent, of course, an, an advance for sure, an advance per, for uh, monitoring and analysis of a tunnel because it requires just uh, the remote supervision by one operator. But expected improvements will have to uh, will allow to carry out monitoring activities without the need of uh, a surveyor or this is our hope of course thank you for your for your attention thank you very much thank you very much you were perfectly in time <laughs> if uh, there are questions uh, we can uh, ask something to the people and uh, in your opinion uh, 
And in your fields of, uh, of, of, of studies, uh, will you going to use uh, this type of technology for which purposes mainly, in your opinion? Yes, of course, for, for monitoring purposes. That's our, uh, our goal, of course. Yeah, but you have a specific application in your minds or...? Okay, just the application I showed you before, but um, okay, we can use this platform, of course, indoor, but you can use, you can use it, of course, also outdoor to monitor in the slope or uh, everything related with, uh, okay, some, something dangerous where you can go in, uh, in person, so... Okay. Okay, thank you a lot. Any other questions for uh, Enrico? Okay, if not, we can proceed on and uh, the next speaker is uh, Filippo Sarvia. He is, uh, uh, but he comes from uh, the Department of Agriculture, Forest and Food Science of the University of Torino. He's going to present a work concerning methodological proposal to support estimation of damages from hailstorms based on Copernicus Sentinel to data time series. Uh, um, Filippo. Yes, I am here. Yeah. I'm trying to share my screen. Yeah. Okay. You can see my screen. Okay, are you see my slides? Yes, perfectly. You can proceed. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Rico, for our presentation. Uh, good morning to everyone. This work is a uh, Copernicus Sentinel to Data Time series to support the estimation of damage caused from hailstorm. The goals of this work was to explore the potential of passive road sensing to support the agricultural insurance company to map and qualify the errors damaged by hail, and to compare the short, long, and multi-temporal series approach to check the errors damaged and the possible vegetative recovery of the crops. With the short-term approach, we want to observe the effects of the hail immediately after the event. With the long term, we want to observe the effects of the hail after one month of the event. And with the multi-temporal series approach, we want to monitor the phenological development of the crops after, uh, uh, for all the year. The study area is in Vercelli. The Rale Mutua, an important Italian insurance company, gave us this work and research to investigate for this big hairstorm that occurred on the 6th of July in 2019. For this work, uh, we used Copernicus Sentinel-2 data. We used an image before the hailstorm because we wanted to observe the condition of the fields before this event. Then, for the short-term approach, we used the image of the 16th of July because it was the first good image after the hailstorm. And, for the long-term approach, the image of the 8th of July to see the crop's condition after one month. For the time series approach, we used 29 sentinel two images for a monitor the development crops for the entire year. We also used a vector map provided by the Rale Mutua Insurance Company. This map gives us information about uh, um, the plots affected by hail and other unharmed. You can see in red the plots damaged and in green the plots decreted unharmed. The crops damaged and examined in this work were two fields of rice, two fields of soybean, one of wheat, and one of corn. The NDVI was used to assess the crop condition because this spectral index summarized the degree of vegetative activity of the plant. You can see its calculation from the formula. The multi-temporal NDVI profile has been filtered by Savizzi Golet and interpolated to five days. So, we pass from 29 images downloaded to about 70 images. The hailstorm area was detected by producing NDVI difference map that was calculated by grid difference about two images. The first one on the left after the event with the image of 16th of July. The second one in the middle before the event with the image of the 6th of July. 
The destructive action of hail on crops make lower the local NDVI values in the damage fields, and it is mean a biomass loss. So we use a threshold of delta minus 0.05 NDVI to identify and map the affected crops. Okay, um, on the left, you can see the plots affected by hail after the application of the threshold. The red area represents the field damage. The total of this hail, the total of this hailstorm area was about 1,500 of hectares. On the right, we make a check of the provided fields by the Reale Mutua Insurance Company. The fields declared damage are inside the hailstorm area and the unharmed are very far from uh, the hailstorm area. After this first analysis, we proceeded to quantify the level of the damage. In Italy, we use an ordinary short and long-term approach. In the short term, we can only observe two fields unharmed by the hail in the middle of the table, one with the soybeans and the other one with the rice. They have, NDV, they have NDVI positive value. You can see that with the green number in the table. For the short term approach, the other fields are all damaged. We cannot hear anymore. Uh, I hope uh, connection uh, didn't lost, but uh, okay, connection lost. Connection lost. Yeah, there is uh, the icon of connection lost. The gray, it's gray. Okay, what's going on? So, what we have to do? Uh, try to to wait a, a bit, but yeah, we can try to wait a little bit. We are not late, so we can try to. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay thank. You. I stop it a little bit in counter of time. What's going on? Can you hear? Yes, I'm here. I don't know what happened. Okay. We can hear you now, but we lost the last uh, two minutes. Okay. Uh, sorry, I can try to share again my my, my screen. No, no. We are looking at it, but you know, we are... We, we, okay. Yes, there, it's coming. Yeah, okay. Are you, are, are you, are you, are you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, sorry, so. but I don't know what's happened. Uh, okay. So I can uh, return here. Well, uh, uh, I don't remember, but uh, uh, I can uh, okay. start from here, from this table. Okay, okay, okay. thank you. So after the, the analysis, we proceeded to quantify the level of the damage. Initially, we ordinarily uh, used the short and long term approach. In the short term approach, in the middle of the table, we can only observe two fields unharmed by the hail, what one with soybeans and the other one with the rice. They have NDVI positive value. You can see that with the green number in the table. For the short-term approach, the other fields are all damaged. In the long-term approach on the right, the condition of the fields after one month of the event, we can observe the recovery of all the fields except the core one, the red in the table. This field has negative NDVI value. Well, to validate these results, we compare the multi-temporal NDVI index profile of a damaged field with one unharmed with the same crops. The green profile was the unharmed and the red one was the damaged one. In this case, we are observing the rice profile, but there are not major differences between these two profiles. For, uh, for the soybeans field, uh, the one on the left uh, is uh, completely unharmed as in the short-term analysis. And the second one on the right, we can see a difference after the airstorm. 
after the dashed black line, we can see a drop of NDVI. But we can also observe the recovery by the crops and the correct phenological development. The last two profiles are for the corn and wheat crops. In the first one on the left, we can observe two profiles of corn. Here, we can see a complete destruction of the crops. In this case, the corn has not recovered because, the, because after the hailstorm, we can, see, we can observe a drop of NDVI from 0.05 to 0.03. The increase of NDVI in September is due to the presence of pests. For wheat, the long-term approach shows us that the crop had recovered. But thanks to the profile and agronomy skills, we know that this crop was harvested before the event, so it didn't suffer any damage. The degree of the damage can be different in the same field. This difference can be calculated by the anomaly formula, where alpha is the NDVI value of a single pixel in the damaged field at the T-day, and mu is the, NDVA, is the NDVI value of the field at the same T-days. So, uh, the positive anomaly means lower damage for that pixel than the average of the field. The negative anomaly means higher damage than the average of the field. In uh, conclusion, we can say that the Copernicus Sentinel-2 data can indeed support the analysis of hail damage in agriculture. The NDVI perfectly describes the impact of hail. The characteristic of this data, temporal frequency of five days and 10 meters of geometric resolution, allow the use for this application, improving the reading and skills of insurance company. Thank you for your attention and sorry for the, the problem. Okay, uh, you were perfectly on time in spite of uh, uh, the problem that you, you suffered from. Anyway, uh, uh, any questions? I, I know very well this works, so I have no <laughs> uh, question to, to do, but I hope uh, some others have some questions about this. Any questions, please? Okay, if no one is, uh, has a question, we can proceed on. It's not correct. I, I told about the work I collaborate with. So the next speaker um, should be, uh, let me check it, uh, Mirko Saponaro. Uh, yes. Hi, Mirko. He is a PhD student by the Politecnico of, of Bari, and he's going to speak about parallel development of comparable photogrammetric workflows based on UAV data inside software platforms. So please, uh, Mirko, uh, yes. tell about uh, your work. Good morning to everyone. I try to... Uh, uh, can you see the, the screen? Yes, perfectly. Okay, perfect. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for the presentation, Professor Borboni Mondino. So, it is a pleasure to present you our research work, uh, which is the result of the collaboration between the Edge Lab uh, of Polytechnic of Bari and the CPL SPA. Today, many industrial applications benefit from the accessibility of structure from motion techniques for 3D dimensional modeling of different objects at different scales. On the other hand, in the last decade, decade there has been a, an exponential growth of software platform and their algorithms enabled to return detailed photogrammetric products. However, the different levels of final accuracy resulting from the adoption of different processing uh, approaches in various softwares have not yet been fully understood. Uh, of course, not validation analysis uh, has been conducted uh, to consider these products as repeatable and reproducible. In consideration of the way uh, products are validated geometrically, as drafted by SPRS, for example, or often by national regulation, the dependency between the evaluation made and the coherence of the results remain unexpressed. We find some questions very interesting, in particular, is there a photogrammetric workflow independent of the chosen platform for processing the same data? Can the behavior of the various software in terms of the result that can be obtained from the different GGPs implemented 
be considered comparable. And uh, given the SPRS accuracy standards, can products return it from different software platform be considered consistent? This work therefore aims to provide a comparative evaluation of three photogrammetric software commonly used in the industrial field in order to obtain coherent results, if not exactly congruent. The tests carried out were aimed at investigating the elements shared by the platform tested with the purpose of supporting future studies to define a single index for the accuracy of final products. The tests were carried out on a data set registered about the excavation area of a road section in the trench of the Pedamontana uh, Veneta Highway in the Veneto region. The images were acquired by a low cost camera mounted on board the professional multicopter Colibri, supplied by the SIPAL uh, SPA. The flight was performed uh, at the aid of about 50 meters above the ground obtaining a, a ground sample distance of uh, 1.23 centimetre pixel and covering an area of uh, about uh, nine uh, hectares, uh, considering uh, an overlap of uh, uh, 80% in the wall area. The UAB in particular was equipped uh, with uh, a Nike Precision Genesis rover receiver, which is in, um, in continuous mode uh, records the coordinates of images in RTK mode. Finally, 20 targets were distributed throughout the entire scene. The targets were then measured in RTK mode 2, achieving an, an average accuracy equal to 2 cm along the three axes. The work is set up in two sections. In the first section, an overall photogrammetric workflow was structured in parallel in three different software, Agisoft Photoscan, Pix4D Mapper, and the open source software MakeMac. And from statistical inference, in the second section, the coherence of product accuracy varying GGP's implementing was analyzed, considering the ISPRS standards. So in the first section, we can see the common structured workflow. In the first step, we define a reasonable setting of the workspace and the arrangement of the calibration parameters of the camera and its level up. In the second step, the software enables the algorithms to search type on image by image, start matching, point, uh, matching algorithms, and after that, computes a sparse point cloud. So the sparse point cloud can be filtered in the first step, from which the software thus learns the correction and processes the improved information about the relative orientation of the images. After we go into the collimation phase, the bureau of collimation phase, where identify image by image on display the GGPs and the GPs. After BBA computation, just the refined the geometry of the scene by minimizing square reprojection error between the points in the images and those in the photogrammetic block. The processing pipelines were carefully parameterized for each software, generating a sparse point cloud uh, in each one of them, as we can see in this slide where the features of the sparse point cloud from the three software are explained. Uh, GGPs are were implemented through only one out uh, technicians, thus generating a wide case history of uh, 21 models for each workspace. In the second section, the values obtained from the 21 GGPs and GPs management cases implemented for each software, uh, and therefore from the related BBA processes, were analyzed and compared to the geometric standard widely accepted by the scientific community as updated by ISPRS in 2015. The ISPRS defined accuracy classes based on root mean square error, RMSC, free shows evaluated on GPS and GGPS. At the same time, the absolute mean errors obtained along the three axes will be analyzed, looking for possible systematism. These figures, sorry, these figures show the trends in RMSC along the three axis values and the mean errors recording the various cases of georeferencing in Agisoft Photoscan in red and MicMac in, uh, sorry, in Photoscan in uh, green and MicMac in uh, red, considering in this case the BBA processes completed by the, so no, 
uh, not implementing the geotags of the images uh, in the various BBA processes, sorry. After these graphs show the trends in the MSE uh, and mean errors values, recorded instead in the various cases of georeferencing uh, cases uh, in Pix4D map in blue, and MIC map in red. One but, minute. Yes, I'm uh, concluding. Um, but in this case, uh, considering the BBA process is completed by the position information of the images. So the, these last figures integrate the MSC values obtained in the three software and compares them with the three shots set by the SPRS uh, for digital planimetric data and for vertical data. Um, it is uh, fundamental to see that the, that the processing in different software, being it carried out in accordance with the common workflow, generate results that are not congruent, but in most cases, uh, Coherent. In fact, as it is possible to observe, both planar and vertical RMSC values assume comparable trends, maintaining, in most cases of, uh, of implemented georeferencing, the same class of accuracy set by the SPRS standards. So, the conclusion, the most important, is that uh, the, the three software uh, do not present congruent behaviors, but reach consistent uh, accuracy values. Uh, we have a uh, uh, so, uh, product that uh, have uh, same quality class and uh, to investigate a unique independent index of the software platform, uh, it will be necessary to analyze future um, study scenarios. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Mirko. It's very interesting work. Is Thank there you. any question concerning this work from uh, the listeners? Sorry, I, I don't know what understand. If uh, there is any question for Mirko from the listener. Okay, thank you. If not, I, I have to say that this is a very interesting work because uh, it uh, focuses on a very, very uh, sensitive problem, which is the one concerning the consistency of uh, results obtained from the same data set with different softwares and procedures. This is a very basic step in in order to understand the robustness of the results. It's really interesting. My uh, invitation is also to test, while comparing software, to test uh, the spatial distribution of errors, in order yeah. to understand not only the value, but also the distribution of the errors around the area, in order to understand if the major errors concentrate in the same area or are different distributed by the software. This is going to be a problem for you. Thank you for this suggestion. Okay. Okay. If no other questions come from uh, the other ones, so we can proceed to the last work. Thank you, Mirko, again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, the last one uh, is uh, Ernesto Bernardo, and uh, he's going to present a work uh, concerning road catastrophe an innovative system to update information from big data elaboration. Very scheme. I'm going to wait attentively, careful this type of presentation. Please, Bernardo. Can you share the screen this time? <laughs> yeah. Can you? Um, okay, great. Okay, perfect. Please. We cannot hear you. Yeah. Okay. We can... S we can see the presentation, but we can not hear you. Check the microphone. Try to mute and unmute. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Refresh the browser. I hear you. Mm, I think uh, we don't hear. Fernando, can you hear?
Can you hear me or not? Uh, you're refreshing the browser. Okay. What's going on? What's going on? I still uh, see him offline. We cannot recognize anymore him there. He's not present in the room. Can you confirm? He no, isn't. he isn't. What have to do? Uh, maybe we should try to go to the next one, or uh, he's the last. Yeah, he was the last. Okay, no problem. Uh, uh, we can still wait until uh, 10 and 50. Okay. Let's wait a little bit, if you if can uh, solve his, his problems. <laughs> Sono il chair della sessione, volevo sapere il giorno in cui mi connetto non avrò bisogno di password o di altro. Pronto? No, eh, non avrà bisogno di password, semplicemente basta che si connette e poi si imposta nome e cognome sul profilo. No, non oh, di... Io ho soltanto questo problema, la mia sessione è suddivisa in tre, in tre, diciamo, in tre gruppi orari, ognuna delle quali ha un chair. Però gli altri due ter sono impossibilitati a, prese a, diciamo, a presenziare, quindi sarò io il CER per tutti e tre i blocchi. Ci sono okay. problemi? No. no, non penso ci sia un problema. Sento al volo l'assistenza e. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, okay. now yes. We can also see you. Sorry. Va bene, magari segnalo la cosa murgante, vediamo così se magari la cambiamo a priori. Sì, va bene, intanto segnalo anche io. Ok. Ok. Lado. Ok. 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 okay. okay. Um, We can see your presentation. Rada Cadastro, an innovative... Uh, Rada Cadastro, an innovative system to update information from big data elaboration. Uh, study and development of uh, advanced monitoring techniques for uh, the inspection and mapping of road infrastructure uh, is a research activity proposed. Uh, objective of the research are design and implementation of an innovative measuring system, implementation of algorithms uh, dedicated to managing uh, the quantity of georeferenced data obtained, a representation of the data obtained on GIS platform, uh, updating the road cadastre. The operation were tested on the with traffic in the territory of the city of Merito di Porto Salvo, Southern Italy, on a low density and traffic area. We have tested an uh, innovative uh, procedure that involves the use of a uh, properly designed fleet of drones, which uh, A to point B allows to acquire images uh, of the object of study. Subsequently, the images uh, uh, are processed by appropriate uh, automated uh, finalized uh, uh, algorithm uh, for the identification of uh, uh, photoless uh, road signs, uh, traffic lights, uh, uh, manuals and their uh, subsequent uh, display and updating uh, of a basic cartography on the GIS system. The acquired data are therefore uh, high the resolution uh, images uh, with uh, uh, sampling frequency. 
In this research, we focused specifically on the analysis of the attributes in the database uh, that uh, can be identified through the classification and segmentation of the images uh, acquired by the proposed system. Presence of uh, deterioration of the road surface, presence and maintenance status of the original signs, vertical traffic lights, and the presence of uh, We have used the uh, fleet of uh, automated drones uh, connected to the, uh, lo a local network that are automatically researched through the special searching station located in uh, pre-established uh, points. With the integration of the GLOT platform, the drone fleet uh, obtains a fit uh, of data uh, in uh, real time. Uh, which is uh, subsequently processed by the algorithm to the select uh, the images. Uh, using the solution, DJI Magic uh, Pro Dual Drones, uh, 500 charging pad, etc., uh, we can control a fleet of automated uh, cloud connection uh, connected uh, drones. In particular, the process of uh, this research is divided in uh, two free automated phases schematized uh, the flow chart uh, of the figure three, and uh, which provide the defini definition of, of the flight plan in terms of uh, ground sampling distance, image overall and uh, waypoint route, uh, image analysis, pre-processing segmentation classification, uh, and the data geolocation geo on the GIS platform in order to associate each element of the GIS with the coordinates relating to the data implemented in the, in the database. In order to populate the database, uh, we appropriately process the image acquired through the described acquisition system, extracting the characteristics of the infrastructures, uh, the presence of uh, the road surface, the presence and maintenance status of the horizontal and vertical signs, and the presence of uh, manuals. The acquired uh, images uh, were uh, automatically subject to a pre-processing and, uh, and um, enhancement process segmented. Uh, Speak closer to the microphone, please. The what? We cannot hear you. Uh, okay. I can hear you. Try to talk, uh, Ernesto. Can you hear me? Yes, but uh, I don't understand. Uh, we cannot hear you very well. Yes. Now you? we we can we can we can go proceed on. Okay, let's proceed. Uh, okay. Damn it. It's okay. In, try to speak. Okay. Okay. It's okay. Right gone. And if you are talking now, we can't hear you. I suggest to refresh the browser again. Yeah, try to refresh the browser. Okay, you're here. Okay, or? yes, uh, you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I am sorry, but uh, I don't have uh, any idea where is the problem. Okay.
Okay. Uh, the affair uh, images were automatically subjected to uh, pre-processing and uh, enhancement process. Then uh, they were uh, segmented and classified uh, with the support, support vector uh, machine in order to be able to extrapolate the information uh, we need. The database was built with the, with the vector uh, uh, graphic system system a subsystem to capture units uh, of the drone jpeg image folders related to elaboration hash files containing the connection information between the trajectory that data and the elaborated uh, images uh, for the construction of uh, the geodatabase, uh, we proceed uh, by creating and naming uh, the database on uh, pg admind and uh, inside in the PostGIS spatial extension, uh, extension was uh, inserted. A connection to the database was built on QGIS in PG Admine and uh, through the DB Manager plugin PostGIS was uh, chosen uh, among um, the available uh, spatial ex extensions. Uh, thus creating the database table, tables with spatial component. Uh, in the figure, uh, we can see the result uh, of automatic uh, detection on GIS. In particular, uh, we can see in the 14 uh, manuals, uh, uh, 52 between uh, vertical and horizontal um, pinyas, and 96 cracks uh, were detected. We realized the first update map uh, showing the road network uh, updated by the data collected uh, by the proposed experimental system. Uh, One minute remaining. Clearly visible from the images and both the, and both the presence of signs uh, or uh, artifacts and the condition of uh, the road surface can be determined. Uh, from an uh, economic point of view, the construction of the road cadastro is very expensive. However, if uh, implemented with the road body maintenance uh, functions, uh, this can be a great tool for the management uh, agencies uh, who can um, then schedule uh, maintenance based on GIS indication. We therefore decided to analyze, uh, analyze uh, how to implement um, the road cadastro in order to be able to use it uh, for planning the maintenance of uh, horizontal road signs uh, through the implementation of uh, function uh, for the modeling of the performance process of the signage. In future, uh, future developments, uh, I made uh, the implementation of uh, functions uh, allow the planning of uh, maintenance uh, of uh, additional elements such as road pavement, vertical signage, uh, and the works of art related, related uh, to roads. Thank you for your att att attention and uh, sorry for uh, the problem. Okay. Excuse me. Thank you, Bernardo. Thank you. Uh, okay, any question concerning this uh, troubled uh, presentation, in spite of the efforts, of course, of Bernardo? <laughs> it's a technical <laughs> problem, of course. It's, it's not up to you. Any question? Okay, uh, if uh, there is no question, this is a very interesting issue, of course, for a very, very operational applic application that uh, could be very useful for maintaining our roads and uh, making more efficient this type of uh, survey. Uh, well, so if no other one has uh, questions, we have to conclude our session. I am going to thank all the all the speakers for their valuable presentation and uh, for the interesting contents of all of them, in spite of the difference of the issues that were touched by each of them. And I hope also the listeners are have been uh, quite satisfied by the content of this personally satisfying uh, session. So thank you everybody for your participation, contribution and speak speeches. Thank and you very much. You okay, see you. I thank leave you. Uh, the place thank to you. the next chair. Okay. Yeah. And I leave the room at this point. Thank you.
buongiorno a tutti, volevo approfittare della pausa per preparare la, eh, la prossima sessione. Io sono Marco Scaglioni, tu sei... Sì, sono eh, Federico Sabatini. Perfetto, perfetto. Eh, allora, io non sono riuscito a eh, inserire il mio nome completo, mi sa. Allora, deve cliccare i tre pallini in basso a destra sullo schermo e poi il okay. web, eh, che ci dovrebbe essere scritto your profile oppure forse fellow gister qualcosa del genere dovrà gestisci qualità della chiamata statistiche full... ok perfetto ok ok eh, sopra ah sì sì visto sopra, sopra c'è il um... C'è il nome che probabilmente si può cambiare, perfetto. Esatto, sì, bisogna cliccare e poi si può cambiare. Perfetto. Ok. Un tweet, perfetto. Quindi, questo è a posto. Eh, adesso si dovrebbe vedere il mio nome e cognome. Eh, poi... Eh, le, eh, le, pre le presentazioni le lancia ciascun, ehm, ciascun ciascuno speaker o le, eh, o le, lan o le lanciamo noi? Ah, eh, dobbiamo, per le presentazioni deve chiamarlo lei eh, in ordine, poi se non è presente il relatore deve chiamare il successivo o comunque in base ai problemi che non riesce a trasmettere, non riesce a fare la condivisione dobbiamo agire così Però, il, lo speaker condivide la sua presentazione esatto, sì, se riesce sì, se ha problemi deve farlo lei eventualmente quindi le tenga pronte le presentazioni però di solito non è successo okay. finora Questo. ok ah inoltre uh... deve compilare anche un uh, modulo di valutazione per ciascun paper sì, sì, l'ho visto, ce l'ho già, ce okay. già online, l'unico mio problema è quello delle uh, delle presentazioni che devo, che devo, che devo recuperarle. Okay, uh, dovrebbe essere su Riot comunque. Mi porti il telefono per piacere? Mi porti il telefono per piacere? Allora, queste sono tutte le cose.
Okay, I think it's uh, 11 o'clock and we could start the session. Yes. Okay. So, um, good morning everybody. Uh, I'm Marco Scaglioni from Politecnico di Milano University and I'm chairing this session uh, on, uh, of uh, the workshop on geomatics for resource monitoring and management. Uh, during this session, uh, we have four presentations. The first two, they are given by Research for Y, and they concern application of geomatics uh, in agriculture. And the last two presentations, they, are, uh, they can be categorized under the original analysis, and then we be given that by two group Italian. So I will invite the first speaker who will be uh, Florencia Sting uh, to, to connect. Florencia, are you, uh, are you here? Uh, good morning. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. We can? I share my screen. Okay. Can you Okay, me? perfect. So, okay, you, you can display on full screen. Florence, Florencia comes from uh, uh, the Universidad de la Repubblica uh, in from Uruguay. It's a great pleasure to have a presentation from this nice uh, country. Uh, and uh, okay, I let the stage to Florencia and please I recommend to all the speakers to stay on, uh, uh, on time. We have uh, a time uh, of uh, 10 minutes per each presentation, so please leave also some time for questions. Uh, and uh, okay, that's all. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm going to present the paper land cover mapping of agricultural areas using machine learning in Google Earth Engine. As you know, land cover mapping is critically needed in land use planning and policy making. Also, is a uh, an important input in hydrologic modeling. And Google Earth Engine offers a free cloud of satellite information and high computation capabilities for land cover mapping. The primary objective is to, was to explore machine learning in Google Earth Engine and its accuracy for historical land cover mapping of areas mainly characterized by agricultural land use. The study area is in Euro, located in Uruguay, South America. It's representative of the process of agricultural expansion and intensification since the decade of 1990. Um, 2018 uh, land cover map uh, shows that 62% of the area is, was cropland and 31% was native grassland. <clears throat> so a land cover map of 1919 is fundamental to evaluate the land cover change in this area. Um, the approach uh, was divided in five phases. The first one was the imagery selection and pre-processing. Um, images from Landsat 5 satellite was used as the images were av available uh, freely um, so a search for, for uh, winter scenes uh, that was the, the season that the main agriculture uh, takes place, took place. Uh, the main 
um, crop were wheat and barley. <clears throat> Since from the early growth stage of winter crops were found, in this period uh, also soil pasture were in the big growth. <clears throat> And also were analyzed uh, summer scenes uh, during the peak growth of summer crops that were sorghum, corn, and green. <clears throat> Images from uh, winter, uh, 1990 winter and 1990 summer were used uh, for training and validation. And also images from 1991 were considered to make a cross year validation uh, of the. <clears throat> classification. The second phase was the selection of classes and training samples. A visual interpretation of the image were made and to choose the classes. The classes considered were for the classification were water bodies, native grassland, flat plains, sour pasture, winter cropland, summer cropland, summer fallow, and bare soil. Uh, the third phase was the classification process. A supervised classification approach was made using a classification and regression tree classifier implemented in Google Earth Engine. A statistical accuracy as assessment uh, was applied to train and validate an across year validated data set. The results show uh, the classified image achieved high overall accuracy. Uh, the overall accuracy ranged from 0 0.96 to 1. Kappa uh, varied in the range of 0 0.95 to 1. Producer accuracy varies uh, in a range of 0 0.87 to 1. And uh, consumer accuracy varied in a range of 0 0.44 to 1. <clears throat> The fourth phase was the post-classification process. For that, uh, the seasonal variation between uh, winter and summer classification was taken in account to better distinguish the class of interest and to the class pre-assignation. For that, uh, five classes were considered to construct the final map. They were water bodies, native grassland, soil pasture, winter cropland, summer cropland, and double cropland lands. 1884 percent of the area that was classified as native grassland on winter image stayed as native grassland on the final map. Uh, the 16 percent uh, was assigned to a cropland class. The last phase was the validation of the map using uh, information from 1919 General Census of Agriculture. Um, the comparison between the land cover map and the data of the census uh, should, uh, show a good agreement uh, of the constructed map. Uh, in the image you can see uh, the final land cover map of the San Salvador Basin in 1919. Uh, the main land cover was uh, native grassland with 57% uh, of the coverage. Uh, then winter cropland with 28%. Uh, and soil pasture with almost 10% uh, of the land cover. Uh, the analysis of the land cover change shows that native grassland was reduced in a 45% and cropland increased in uh, 57%. And Summary, a summary and conclusion. Uh, this study presented an efficient approach to estimate the land cover of an agricultural basin using free open source tools. The met methodology presented was capable to deal with the scarcity of historical quality scenes. Uh, Google Earth Engine showed excellent potential in land cover mapping with high processing efficiency. For future research, uh, this methodology can be improved by a multi-satellite approach 
and temporal map series of the same watershed can be developed as well as other catchment. Okay, thank you very much. And um, if you have any question. Okay, thank you, Florencia, for your interesting presentation. Uh, are there any questions from the auditors? Waiting uh, for questions. In in the meanwhile, I I would like to um, to make uh, uh, to make a question. What about the validation of your results? Have you carried out any? Uh, uh, validation and listing some parts of your uh, case study area? Um, for data validation, the only data I had was census data. So here uh, I can show grassland, uh, inland cover map, and show uh, that 55% of the basin and in the census data was uh, 52. Uh, cropland, that the other important class, was 29 in line cover map and 24% in the census data. Uh, for example, forest coverage, it's a very small land use. And I, uh, I see that the, um, um, the limits of the census tracts were not so uh, uh, exact, um, ex were not so exact, so I think there's um, a limit error. And the area of forestation uh, stay outside from the the area evaluated here. But in general, um, and so what pastures uh, were underestimated. Uh, this is a difficult class uh, to, uh, to detect. Yeah, because the, the scenes were scarce. Scar scar uh, scar there, there was a scarcity of scenes. Uh, when I look at the scenes, I could uh, see by visual interpretation, uh, so were pastures, but, but that uh, was because the, the, the time, uh, the period of time that I, uh, I have the scene. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you for your explanation about this important step of your, of your research. Uh, okay, thank you very much for your, uh, for your presentation and uh, uh, we can move uh, to, the, uh, to the next speaker if there are no other questions. Uh, and uh, the following speaker is uh, uh, Angela Gorgoglione. She's still from the uh, same uh, university in Uruguay, but uh, from the School of Engineering instead of the School of Agronomy as uh, Florencia. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Angela to uh, share her screen and to, to start uh, her presentation. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me fine? Yes, we I'm but trying to yes, share okay. my screen. Can you? Okay, can you now it's shared. You can see. Okay, you have to display it full screen. Perfect. Well, good morning again. A really early good morning for us from Uruguay. <laughs> Uh, today I'm going to present you the result, uh, one of the results of the collaboration that uh, here from Universidad de la República we are having with uh, professors, researchers from Politecnico di Bari. 
The title is uh, Application of the Self-Organizing Map to Characterize a Nutrient Urban Runoff. Urban stormwater runoff is one of the principal causes that contribute to the diffuse pollution. Diffuse nutrients are challenging to manage and reduce since their quantification is difficult to evaluate. In fact, it is not possible to identify a point source and they are generated by the contribution of many small sources. Eutrophication, for example, is one of the typical consequences of the abundance of nutrients in surface water bodies. Therefore, the sustainable management of urban watersheds plays a crucial role in the protection of the quality of surface water bodies. Based on these considerations, this study aimed to identify the main factors that influence nutrient buildup and wash off from urban areas. We took into account in this study the non-linearity of the processes involved and the multidimensionality of the system by using the SOM technique. SOM stands for self-organizing map. The investigated area is uh, here represented is a urban watershed located in San Nicandro di Bari in southern Italy, in Puglia region. Um, the catchment area includes 70% of impervious surface and the land use map indicates that uh, almost the entire basin is residential. And then, well, the, the stormwater drainage network is about two kilometers long and is made of concrete. For this study, we, are, we uh, used three different data sets that we called observation, simulation, and generation data set. Uh, the first one is constituted by observed precipitation, flow rate, and water quality that were monitored during five monitoring events. When I talk about water quality, I'm considering here total suspended solids, total nitrogen, and total phosphorus. All these data were the input of an hydrologic, hydraulic, and water quality model here um, called a SWIM. SWIM stands for Stormwater Management Model. And um, this model was used to um, create also the simulation data set. In fact, uh, the latter is uh, made of observed precipitation that are exactly the five uh, monitoring precipitation events uh, of the observation data set. And then we simulated flow rate and water quality with the SWIM model. Um, at the end, we have the generation data set. Uh, it is so called because uh, we are considering here generated precipitation that we have generated from the IRP model, iterated random pulse model. Um, we uh, generated a time series of 15 years uh, with uh, 15 minutes of aggregation. We identified 567 rainfall events that we used as input of swim model, and then we uh, simulated flow rate and water quality. Therefore, we have a total of 577 uh, events that we are considering here for this analysis. Uh, these events were the input of our SOM analysis. Um, I already explained why we are using this, uh, this technique. Uh, here I just briefly say that SOM is a particular type of art artificial neural network and is trained using unsupervised learning uh, for dimension reduction. Here we are showing one of the different results that we got with this uh, technique. Uh, we have, first of all, let's see which are the variables that we consider for our, our study. We have two different groups of variables, rainfall runoff variables that includes antecedent dry period, total rainfall and runoff volume. And then we have water quality variables that includes event mean concentration and event mean loads of total suspended solids, total nitrogen, and total phosphorus. 
Um, this first uh, result of some are called uh, the weight maps. Uh, the map size is evaluated with this equation here that you can see, where M is the number of neurons and N is the number of data points that in our case are 577. Therefore, we have a M equal to 121 and uh, consequently a map of 11 by 11 neurons. Therefore, each of these nine maps are, uh, if you can <laughs> count here, the rectangles are 11 by 11. And each map is um, um, associated to one of each of these uh, variables that we are considering. So let's go step by step and let's consider, let's start considering uh, the rainfall related variables that are the first three maps up here. So we can see that, uh, ah, first of all, I have to say that red neurons represent um, activating neurons, positive neurons. Blue neurons represent uh, negative neurons. Therefore, here in the first three maps, we can see that total rainfall and runoff volume uh, um, show exactly the same, the same neuron patterns. They activate exactly the same neurons. And these neurons are um, symmetric to the ones activated by antecedent dry period. This means that the redder the activated neurons of antecedent dry period, the greater the water loss in the system, the bluer are the negative neurons of uh, rainfall and runoff. If we consider then the water quality related features up, uh, down here, uh, we can see three map patterns, um, three different map patterns. The first one is represented by the amount mean loads of the three pollutants, suspended solid, nitrogen, and phosphorus. The second one is represented by the event mean concentration of sediments and phosphorus. And the third one alone is the concentration of nitrogen. One of the significant findings achieved with this analysis is the strong relationship between yes, sediment, load, sediment load and nutrient event mean loads, and also between the sediment and the phosphorus concentration, showing the important role of sediment transport in nutrient urban runoff. In particular, in our, in, in, in our study area, phosphorus transport is highly correlated to the sediment washoff, while nitrogen dissolved portion is uh, represented by the symmetric positive neurons. Here we can see it, um, that are completely symmetric with uh, runoff and total rainfall. Furthermore, it is worth remarking that uh, the red positive neurons activated by the antecedent dry, the antecedent dry period that are located here in the high left corner, as well as those activated by pollutants, even mean loads up here. This means that uh, the longer the antecedent dry weather, the higher is the amount of pollutants built up on the impervious surface. For concluding, we can say that antecedent dry period, total rainfall and runoff volume present a strong correlation driven by antecedent dry period. The use of suspended solids as a proxy for the study of the, of the behavior of nutrients in urban areas was confirmed as appropriate. This is particularly, for, uh, particularly true for total, suspended, total phosphorus, sorry. And uh, nitrogen mobilization predomin predominantly occurs in the dissolved form. And also a high correlation was found between antecedent dry period and uh, even mean loads. As I said, the longer the antecedent dry weather, the higher is the amount of pollutants build up on the impervious surface. And this is particularly true for uh, sediments. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Angela. Uh, investigating the urban areas uh, is really, is really uh, important. Uh, 
and uh, uh, I uh, just a very quick question because we are uh, we are out of time and uh, if there is any if uh, 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 if there are not, uh, I remember that you may you, you can uh, uh, continue uh, discussing after the end of the session on our on our platform. Uh, and uh, I, again, Angela, I would like to move to the next uh, to the next uh, presentation. Uh, okay. Now Thank you. We, we, change, uh, uh, we change the topic. And we we go. To Talk about risk analysis and the, and, uh, the next uh, uh, will will be given by uh, the chair disconnected lost the connection uh, we can try to start uh, anyway if you want, I guess this is me. This is my turn. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think. Uh, yes, it's your yes, turn. Yes, it's me. Okay. I'm okay. going to share uh, my yeah, screen. Start sharing. Uh, hoping uh, Marco Scaglioni connect back. Okay. Is it okay? Can you see me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, I'm Alberico from Politecnico di Bari. As usual, I want to thank my co-author Elena Cantatore, Dario Esposito and uh, Francesco Fiorito. And I'm, co I'm going to present you the Rescued Project. Okay, we are billions of people all over the world on this earth. So the increasing uh, anthropization has amplified the, eft, the effect of uh, rapid critical events such as uh, earthquakes or uh, panic uh, in crowded places or Terrorism, terrorist attacks um, on the safety of the built, on, built environment. What is the built environment? Uh, we can consider it as such uh, as the combination of a network of streets, buildings, infrastructure, but also the users, the people in those streets, in these buildings. So it is a connection between people and, um, let's say, constructive elements. But uh, the built environment is also affected by not only by uh, very rapid phenomena, but also by very slow phenomena such as climate change. But the, those phenomena uh, have a, a direct impact on the climate of the cities, on the pollution, on the rainfall levels, but also on the energy consumption and the aging of buildings. So, uh, such critical events affecting the built environment can be referred, referred to as slow onset disasters and rapid onset disasters, SODs and RODs. In the context of the built environment, uh, of course, historic centers are more prone to these events, to RODs and SODs because of, uh, of their value, of course, but also their uh, vulnerability due, due to aging. So the Rescue Project uh, the stands for Resilient Cultural Urban Context to Disaster Exposure. is a method monitoring the effects uh, of uh, those events of sudden roads um, on the geomatic, uh, by using the geomatics, uh, and using managing techniques and also agent based uh, approach. So the rescue project will span from October 2009 to October 2022, and uh, as I told you, is jointly developed by the three research groups of geomatics, of building technologies, and urban plan uh, planning at the Politecnico of uh, Bari, di Bari in Italy. In uh, the context uh, of the, the rescue project, Geomatics will provide uh, 3D resolution models at different scales, large and small scales, of course. And the update of the, uh, those models will provide uh, LS LST, land surface temperature maps, 
will monitor the built environment and will implement a WebGIS in which all the information provided by the three groups will join together. Uh, the build it, building technique group will assess the potential level of the resilience in historic district, will analyze the technologies, the constitutive materials for mitigating the effects of the SODs related to the mainly to the human well-being, uh, let's say, and the reduction of energy consumption. And the third group, urban planning, will evaluate the interaction between people, but also between people and uh, the environment during an emergency as a terrorist attack. We we'll assess the risk level of different special configuration and will define strategies for evacuation management. So the aim of the rescue project is the... Sorry, can you see me? Uh, yes, I can, but okay. uh, I don't know if you change the slide or if you are to the... Rescue rest project, okay. Okay, okay, yes. With the arrow, okay. Uh, so rescued will improve the process of knowledge management and design of the built environment relating to southern road events. Let's focus on the geomatic side of the project. Of course, we will use some survey techniques to provide the high resolution 3D data uh, ranging from satellite to UAV. Uh, to obtain a uh, digital elevation model, but we also will employ, we will employ monitoring techniques able to identify and measure uh, phenomena like subsidence uh, um, using uh, differential interferometry, the INSAR technique. Uh, and we will also acquire thermal image from, uh, to, to, to build the land surface temperature map. In the tables here, you can see, okay, the technique we will, uh, that are prone to be used in the, in the project and uh, the resolution, the accuracy and the limitation and the advantages. Um, where we uh, are going to apply those techniques? In two many municipalities in uh, Apulia region, in Ascoli Satriano and Morfetta. We choose those uh, municipalities, those uh, towns, because they are di very different in some ways. They are representative of the two major Apulian climates, the humid subtropical and the hot summer Mediterranean climate and are very different in uh, the district arrangement and in the constitutive materials. Uh, Morfetta is near the sea, near the coast, is flat. Ascoli Satriano is on, uh, is on a hill, so is uh, steep, is characterized by steep uh, streets and slopes. And uh, this is interesting from the geomatic side, of course, uh, but also from uh, the constructive side and the urban planning side because uh, in case uh, the, 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 those differences may play a determinant role in influencing pedestrian special behavior during emergency, of course. And also, always uh, focusing on uh, the geomatic side, Ascoli Satriano is uh, characterized by the presence of an ongoing subsidence phenomena. Uh, this can provide, okay, further elements to the, uh, this uh, multi-risk analysis. Uh, Ascoli Satriano is slowly going down, as you can see from, uh, from the picture, where red dots represent subsidence and uh, the um, subsidence uh, speed. Okay, just some uh, some remarks. Okay, uh, I, uh, as uh, previously underlined, uh, the particular constructive characteristics of historical centers make uh, them, uh, of course, more prone to be damaged by rods and sods. And uh, geometric methods, uh, together with uh, other technologies such as uh, the efficient the improving the efficiency of efficiency of the buildings uh, of um, of the buildings of okay, uh, or the um, simulation models of the human behavior in case of rod 
of rapid onset disaster, we provide a useful tool for measuring and controlling the evolution of historical centers. Uh, we hope that our project, the rescue project, will allow to carry out, um, will improve the process of knowledge and management. Uh, of the built environment it's always related to, to those risks and the expected outputs uh, will be used to define possible uh, possible scenarios for civil defense as uh, the, defi the defining of uh, escape routes or uh, plan uh, will help the civil protection to plan intervention on buildings uh, telling them how uh, to intervene and when to intervene. Uh, so that's all. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, if there are any questions, you can press the hand icon on the left side uh, or just unmute your microphone and uh, talk. Okay, I think there are no questions. Else uh, you can come anyway discuss it on uh, Riot. And oh. uh, okay, someone talk. Okay, no, thank, thank you very much. much. Uh, Juliana? It's not right. possible to accept to the video. Uh, uh, yes, uh, we can go with the next uh, presenter. Um, I refresh the page. Yes. Refreshing the page. Oh. Okay. It's impossible to accept the video. Okay. Uh... I get some impossible to accept the video camera. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, the problem is uh, you don't have the button or uh, you press the button then uh, can't share? I press the button of okay. the video camera. Impossible to share the video camera. Okay. Uh, I refresh the, the page. Refresh. Uh, yes. Uh, the camera we can see uh, we can see the camera but uh, if you are trying to open the webcam uh, should be on the top right of the browser an icon with uh, the camera and uh, should uh, you should check if uh, it's allowed or denied it's, uh, it's not a problem if you can share the video camera. Uh, uh, try to share the, your screen, uh, your desktop, and uh, we can still uh, go with the presentation. Mm -mm. Uh, niente. Allora, eh, la videocamera non riesco ad accedere, mi dispiace, I'm sorry. Ok, e per okay. il desktop ci riesce, eh. 
ripeti qui allora, il desktop per, per accedere al desktop c'è cioè un pulsante in basso a sinistra dello schermo a fianco alla mano ci sono i, gli avvisi che mi impediscono di vederlo impossibile accedere alla videocamera ah, ecco, ah, ok eh, basta che apri l'avviso okay. e poi fa sì. tipo di smiss sì eccolo ok ok Dovrebbe essere questo. Oh, thanks. No. Non riesco a... Allora, per un attimo si è visto, però mo è tutto nero. Sì. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, please wait for a moment. Ooh. Okay. Uh, si vede un po' che esce dallo schermo sulla destra. You are. Uh, you are seeing my presentation? Yeah, we can, uh, but uh, it's cut on the right. Uh, it go out. Uh, it go out from the, the screen. Mm. Here is is all normal. Is all right. Okay. Wait for a moment, please. Yes. Here. Uh, Alberico, can you please stop your presentation so uh, the program does, doesn't uh, go out uh, when you are? Uh, actually, we see... Thank you, Alberico. Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, we can see the presentation. Um, ecco. Ok. Uh, ok. Now is all right. Yes. Ok. Uh, I mm, full screen uh, is uh, still cut uh, on the right. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it's better uh, without full screen. If there are no comments on the bottom. Ok. Yes, uh, we, I think uh, we can try in this okay. way. Road okay. abstraction for emergencies from satellite imagery. I am from uh, uh, the department of the University Mediterranean of Reggio Calabria and the University IUAB of Venice. After earthquakes, international and national organization need to know territory and roads for international aid. Maps can be made remotely by volunteers with crowdsourcing actions thanks to satellite or aerial imagery. But traditional surveying methods are often time-consuming and laborious. Instead, creating maps is less time can save lives. Development of remote sensing technology in recent years has opened the way to an automatic uh, road detection application and nearly real-time updated maps. This research, still in progress, aims at experiencing quickly obtaining roads through the so-called object-based image analysis, OBIA, by extracting it from satellite data. OBIA is an analysis capable of extracting high symmetry level information from the simple radiometric data acquired by satellite sensors with a structural approach. The first phase is a segmentation that starts from concepts of mathematical morphology. Excuse me. 
It allows to extract objects by segmenting the image according to rules that are chosen ad hoc, covering, for example, the content of the pixel over the shape or conversely, taking into account the shape of the objects to be extracted. Here in the picture, a multi-resolution segmentation that does not take into account the shape factor. Our study area is in Calabria, Melito di Porto Salvo, in province of Reggio Calabria. A satellite imagery and multispectral Iconos 2 pixel size for 4 meters. Multi resolution segmentation, as the classification segmentation based, is an object based technique that distinguishes a structure methodology from classic spectral analysis. With OBIA, it's possible to get from remote sensing information immediately uh, integrable in GIS for the direct realization of the vector maps. The tool used organizes hierarchically data of different topology, integrating also raster and vector data. The context has a role, and we can introduce rules for the location of the objects and to define their relationships, meaningfully increasing so the possibility of a quick and automatic enlargement of the objects on the land surface. Such methodology, by imitating the approach followed in manual photo interpretation, uh, exceeds the limits of a subjective classification by making a homogeneous and reproducible process. Here, the object can be segmented at different levels. Super objects, sub objects are uh, a, have a relationships. Especially, sub objects are subset within of super object, objects. Here, the flowchart: remote sensing image to classify, definition of the nomenclature system, segmentation reference level polygon to classify and segmentation lower level, small polygons, or segmentation upper level, large polygons, defining knowledge base, ancillary data, and classification. This is the process. Segmentation parameters. In this case, we have a single level. Uh, we choose this, the scale of uh, 40, and um, the, the uh, important value has the shape. Segmentation level, this is the segmentation level. This is uh, the segmentation with variability inter polygons. We applied the method illustrated in this paper with a version of the e-cognition software created by Definience and released, released now by Trimble. Other commercial software for uh, satellite image processing, such as uh, MB of uh, L3 Harris Jew Special can perform image segmentation similarly to what obtained with the e-cognition in this application. In e-cognition, the classification is based on the previous segmentation. In MV, instead, the first step is the image classification and only afterwards focus on the segmentation and extraction of the objects. The segmentation process as a feature extraction is based on a watershed by immersion algorithm. <coughs> Developed by Vincent and Suell, that allocates pixel digital number values in an image with elevation points on a topographic surface. <coughs> For comparing the results, we use the spectral angle mapper algorithm to determine the spectral similarity by calculating the angle between the spectra and treating them as a vectors. With a spectral angle mapper, by varying the classification parameters, we identify the first only river beds, and then river beds and the rods. Through a process of subtraction between the two images, we obtain the rods. <coughs> this is the classification in envy and segmentation image. This is a confusion matrix. Overall, uh, overall accuracy is uh, over. 98, over 98%. Identification of the riverbeds. So only the riverbeds. Riverbeds and roads. 
we then we then superimposed on GIS the open street map layers, the segmentation vector achieved by cognition, the classification of the envy, and the results obtained by, from the sub subtraction. Results demonstrate that the object classification compared to a pixel-based classification gives better results. The deviation between the different layers exceeds one meter, therefore the MV classification cannot be used without further processing to refine the results. Layer overlay for validation of results. In this classification, we identified only a few larger rods. The structural methodology with multi-resolution segmentation techniques, unlike the classic spectral or pixel-based analysis, is able to make the best use of the wealth of information detected with remotely sensitive sens data with rapid integration into GIS, allowing the direct and quick production of the vector maps. These results sug suggest further research on fast techniques for map integration for the purposes of humanitarian emergencies. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, please press the button or unmute your microphone. Okay. Uh, Marcus Caglione is back. Uh, if you want, you can take uh, the control of the session. You should uh, unmute your microphone. I muted uh, because uh, there was uh, some noise. Now I think it works. Can you can you listen to me? Yes. Uh, I listen. Yes. Okay. Perfect. I, I'm sorry, but uh, it completely disappeared. We tried a, any any chance to to get connected, but it didn't. Uh, it did uh, work. It's strange that we have half of the session stopped. Uh, it stopped working. Uh, okay. In general, eleven is uh, uh, the critical time for uh, platform because it's uh, one of the most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, let's say frequented uh, uh, time. Anyway, we. Uh, I could follow only the, the uh, first part of. Uh, of the session, uh, and so I, I cannot say anything. But I, I had the presentations uh, from the other speakers. Uh, we had an interesting uh, uh, session, mainly covering two categories of topics: application to our uh, Marco, we can listen uh, very well. Okay, disconnect. Seems uh, disconnected again. Is that? Uh, I think uh, it is connected. Uh, I mute his microphone. Uh, it's a uh, noise coming out, <laughs> still coming out. Okay. Okay, it doesn't work. Anyway, uh, our session is uh, finished. Uh, I think uh, we can uh, proceed with the next session at uh, 11 o'clock. And uh, I thank everyone for presentation. Uh, see you later. Thank you for the support. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry for the problem. No problem. Uh, we are on time. Uh, 
we must end uh, into 11 o'clock. Uh, there is, it's uh, sorry, uh, 12 o'clock. It's 11 and 50. No problem. Okay. Uh, okay. Next session. Chair is Anna Cristina Braga. I don't know if uh, she's here. Yes, I'm here. Good okay. morning to everybody. Good morning. I'm. Uh, if you want to say ready, something, then... I'm ready. I'm ready to start. I'm see if all participants are there. Okay. But, uh, So, Karina is all there. Antonio Pacheco. Hi, Antonio, you are mute your micro. I don't listen. I don't we hear you. you. I can. Antonio. Uh, Antonio, try to check if uh, uh, clicking on the uh, raw pointing to bottom uh, on the right of the microphone, if uh, uh, the selected microphone is uh, the working one, and uh, if it uh, if it is uh, still doesn't work, uh, try to refresh the browser. No, we can listen. Try enter again, Antonio. You can hear us. Okay. He tried to enter again. Yes. I I think uh, it was problems. Uh, I check the others. Sandra. Hi, Antonio again. You have problems <laughs> with the sounds. Maybe uh, another person uh, have a problem with a Mac using a Google Chrome. Uh, ah. In case uh, you should install uh, Firefox. So another another browser? browser? Yes, should try another browser. Oh, so we are not sure if it's a common problem on Mac uh, using Google Chrome, but... Uh, okay. Browser when uh, when uh, he enter again, we try to tell him this. <laughs> yes. And uh, Antonio. Antonio. Okay. If you are using a uh, uh, Mac uh, with the Google Chrome, uh, maybe there are problems. Uh, you should try to change browser. Anyway, uh, in any way, if uh, you are not using Mac, uh, should try to change a browser. Maybe another browser works. Uh, supported browser are Firefox and uh, Google Chrome, Chromium. Okay, try another browser. And uh, Sandra, Sandra Aleixo. Sandra Aleixo is there. The second speaker. Hi, Sandra. I don't hear news about Sandra. <laughs> this is... And uh, Karina. Karina Silva. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hello. Good morning, Hello. Karina. Good Do you listen? You this? Yes, okay? we yeah. listen and uh, we see you very beautiful today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. It's you. And the, the, the next, Francisco, Francisco Machado. Hello. Where are you? You are, you are? Somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> Without picture, but you have a nice voice. We are present. You are the, the last of the session. And uh, um, you know, you and know the- I, I have a question. Uh, we have to have the um, the um, video on, or uh, we have to 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 not have it. 
when the others are uh, presented, it's not necessary, right? But uh, when you are presenting, I think it's not necessary to because the presentation is essential. Right, Federico? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Uh, I was right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you are muted. Uh, the Karina asked if uh, it is uh, necessary to be the video. Uh, ah, uh, uh, the camera. No, the camera, no right. problem. Uh, um, just uh, the sharing the desktop is uh, okay. If uh, uh, Juliana too doesn't uh, use the camera because it doesn't work, so, so it's not a problem. It is not necessary, right? No. No, only the sharing presentation is the essential, right? Yes. I check again for Sandra. Sandra Aleixo, the second speaker. Oh. Sandra? No, there are no Sandra. Antonio, you have already uh, sound. Let's check again. Antonio Pacheco, the first speaker. We lost. Maybe it's installing a different browser. A browser. <laughs> this is the problem of online. If we are present, yes. the coffee break, <laughs> the coffee break have some some delays too, but not so problems with the sound. Somebody, sometimes we see the, the message, somebody disconnects, somebody disconnects. Yes. Somebody down. So, I see the, the letters is the problem to identify who is who, but I try. Uh, there are two fellow. There are someone. Uh, Antonio. Uh, if, okay. are... if Antonio does come back into one minute, we can uh, still proceed with uh, another one. Uh... Presentation. Sec and, uh, yes, we can change because uh, the um, s the second is not present here. Yes, Sandra Leisho. I ask for Sandra. Sandra, can you hear me? Antonio, hello. I have I have to install a Chrome. Okay. We hear you now. You you have just in time to begin. <laughs> uh, you are the first speaker of this session. Uh, yeah. You are ready to start. You know you have eight minutes to present oh, yes. your work. Hello, I see oh, okay. Sandra. Hello, Sandra good morning. Arrives. Good morning. You have this. You are the the second speaker. Yes. Everything is working, Sandra? I think so. I, I didn't try to put uh, my presentation, um, but... But no. don't worry. <laughs> but don't I worry, think it's, so. it's okay. I don't know uh, exactly where can I put, because I, I see... Um, so, um, yeah, we, we will start with uh, the first speaker. Uh, Antonio, uh, I, I, I start to to give you a warm welcome to this session of Cash, and uh, uh, in the order of presentation is one defined in the program. If we are, if we have some troubles with sound or with the the video conference, we try to jump to the other presentation to give the times according to the program. 
So we start with uh, we go start with Antonio with the presentation numbers of surveys and lost customers in busy periods of MM1N systems with bulking. You are ready to yeah. start. You can share your screen. Okay, I will share the screen. Can you see the screen? Not yet. In the left corner, you have the button to share your screen. I've been having, having problems with it. You have problems? Yes. If you send it, uh, Frederic, you can solve this problem or it's better to share with my screen? Uh, yes, if there are problems uh, with the sharing, uh, uh, the chair should share the presentation and uh, the presenter should talk. Uh, I can uh, share using my? Yes. Okay. Uh, send to me, Antonio. Mm -hmm. It should be on the Riot file session. Yes, I think I have. You, you don't change anything in your presentation no, in no, Riot? No, I didn't change. You didn't change? So no. I, I share my... So, I share my screen. Federico. Yes. I have problems in share my screen too. Uh, yes, I can see it. What's happening when uh, clicking on the corner? Nothing happened. Yeah. That's not there. If I change to the toggle title view, I have any change in the share screen. Anyone? Anyone is sharing the screen? No. No. So. Mm -hmm. If Sandra, try to stop okay. your video. Try to stop your video. And, uh, okay, okay. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> okay, okay. Only in the camera, in you the cam can stop. Um, stop. Yes. All right. I will try to share now, but I have no. I use the the Mozilla Firefox. Mm -hmm. It should work. Okay. Can I try to share? Uh, yes, I think maybe it's better if uh, Sandra try to share uh, her screen and. Uh, Sandra, try to share your screen. She disconnect. So. Uh, France, uh, another. Francisco, 
try to share your screen. Uh, I was I was actually trying to. Uh, the The browser is not giving me the option to share uh, my actual presentation. I could uh, share my whole uh, monitor. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, some uh, sound warning. See, yes. Oh, this is Anna. Anna, I'm sharing Sandra presentation. You okay. can share. Yes, yes. I tried to, to share it. Sandra's presentation, and it's done. <clears throat> you cannot minimize your presentation so you open the presentation and then share application please do not minimize it yes i'm i'm in the full in the pdf view in presentation and i try to share the antonio presentation you see the presentation or not in my screen yes or uh, Antonio, Antonio presentation. Which number is Antonio? Antonio is Elena, Elena, Elena Ribeiro. It's in the name of Elena. Anna, try. Thank you. Elena H. Ribeiro. Well, that's that, there's an error opening. Okay, that's now. So now I'm trying to share the presentation, the application presentation when I open. Okay, I, I can share my screen to okay. see if you what I see. Okay. Okay. Yes. I'm sharing. Thank you, Anna. I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Yes. You are seeing what I'm seeing. Yes, so we can see the and, browser. Uh, uh, I can. Uh, open and see here okay are you seeing uh, now we are, no, no we can't no. see anymore uh, the the desktop so you are not seeing my my screen no absolutely no. because now i'm sharing uh, antonio presentation yes but when i not closing okay when i minimize it just minimize it. Um, now it's open? Yes. But I cannot minimize it. I just change of applications. Now I'm going to GT application and it's there. So when I share my screen, just click the button when, where you say share your screen, okay? And yes. then you have three separators. Okay, I, I'll talk in Portuguese because they are Portuguese. Okay, so partilhar o ecrã e depois vem três que diz o seu ecrã inteiro, janela de aplicação e separador do Chrome. Sim. É verdade? Sim, Ana, isso aparecia Sim. ontem quando eu testei, hoje não aparece. Uh, António e Sandra, algum vê isso? Uh... Eu estou constantemente não, 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 não. a a net. Sim, sim, sim. sim, sim. E depois, quando eu faço, quando eu seleciono a opção do meio, janela de aplicação. Sim, era isso que eu ontem conseguia fazer, não. hoje não consigo. Quando eu, vejo, quando eu vou à janela de aplicação, eu tenho a apresentação do António aberta, não pode estar minimizada, tá? está aberta e aqui vemos todas as aplicações que eu tenho abertas, obviamente. Uh, e eu seleciono a aplicação que eu quero partilhar, que é a do António. Mas se eu minimizar, se eu minimizar, uh, se eu minimizar, tá? eu deixo de ver a janela da aplicação. Não fechei, apenas minimizei. Tá? Vou lá outra vez e abro. E depois mudo e vocês já estão a ver. Se quiserem, eu posso estar a partilhar e, e, e vai falando e eu não sei, é, é para ir avançando. Oh, Oi, Ana, eu ia tentar fazer. Eu acho que quem está aí a, a, a gerir a sessão. É, yeah, sou o Federico. 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 Eu vou deixar de partilhar, quero ver se vocês conseguem, não sei se não estarão a partilhar, se... 
I think uh, we have problems with sharing our screens. Uh, I have permission to share. Yes. Yesterday, uh, yesterday I test in an empty room with Francisco and everything works. Today, I try to do the same thing. I try to share and I any action is uh, is uh, active. If I click in the button to share yeah. your screen, I don't see anything and reaction. Okay. I. Uh, someone is sharing. Now uh, it's Damiano Perdi. Uh, we can see it, Damiano, but uh, uh, someone can't share uh, for a browser problem, I think. Uh, I think there are a superior imposition here. I think uh, I can try to share the presentation. Uh, if you can uh, tell me the number, I can download it and uh, share uh, for you. To, uh, 231. Okay. We don't see anything yet. Yes, uh, I'm sharing the right now. Just a moment, please, please. Just to know, I was, I am using Chrome. I don't know if you're I'm using Chrome. I will try to change for Chrome, Anna. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, yes, it's perfect. Okay, uh, you can start uh, and uh, tell me why when uh, change page. Okay. Okay, you can change page now. So um, I'll start with the model description, then present the goal of the paper, and uh, then we address probability really generating function of interest. So we will present the algorithm and then make all in uh, change page, please. So um, the system that we are considering is a queuing system where customers arrive one by one by uh, uh, passing process with one. The system has a finite capacity N and uh, a single server. The service times are independent and I think we exponentially distributed variable to the great U. And uh, the customer admission is modulated by the state of the system at the time of arrival. So we have a vector E, where EI is the probability that the customer entering the system, uh, in fact, arrival, he finds high customers in the system. Please change page. Uh, considering trajectories of the process, well, we have uh, Possible as possible transition arrivals with entrance. Please, you can go forward, please. So, uh, without entrance, then three exits, uh, stop here, uh, three exits, and then the system stays empty for a while, and uh, we have another arrival with entrance, and finally, an arrival with entrance. Concerning admission policies, we uh, are considering three different admission policies. One with the, which is called the partial blocking, where customers are accepted unless the system is full. The second one is uh, um, with increasing blocking probabilities, and the, the third one with decreasing blocking probabilities. This is the slide. The, the number of customers in the system constitutes a continuous time Markov chain with a transition rate matrix that is three diagonal. Uh, please change. Uh, 
the, the goal of the, the paper is to characterize the joint probability function of the random vector SI LI, where SI is the number of customers served during an IBZ period, and the LI the number of customers lost during an IBZ period. An IBZ period is a period of time that starts at an arrival instant that makes the system stay with high customers and then set the first subsequent time at which the system becomes empty with the customer initiating service after the arrival instant. Please change slide. In order to uh, uh, characterize the joint probability function, we uh, address the probability generating function of SI LI, which we denote by GI. Uh, from which by taking derivatives, we then can obtain the probability function of the, the vector X, SI LI. Please change slide. For, for uh, addressing the probability generating function, we condition on the event that takes place at the first instant of okay, K after the transition uh, um, of uh, a busy period. So uh, we denote the value of tax by the change that takes place in the number of customers in the system, either minus one if we have an exit, zero if we have a customer arriving without entering the system, and one if a customer arrives and enters the system. The conditional distribution of SN, LN, given that x equal to x is related with the distribution of SN minus 1 ln minus 1 if x takes the value minus 1 and the, the distribution of SN ln if x takes the value 0. Please proceed. And uh, then by applying the probability, uh, total probability law, and substituting the quantities for the probabilities that x takes values minus 1 and 0, we then uh, arrive at uh, uh, an expression for the probability generating function. Please change slide. So first, uh, for that, we have to add um, the, the equations for, for uh, uh, the different values. And uh, uh, when doing that, we arrived finally at the expression for the probability generating functions. Please change slide. Which here relates Gn with the Gn n minus 1 and Gn. So we can uh, finally express Gn as uh, uh, the function theta n times Gn minus 1. Please change slide. Uh, for going down for uh, i equal to n minus 1 up to 1, what appears as new is that we may have variables with, with the customer entering the system. Uh, so x taking the value 1 in that case is just as the busy period started with one more customer, i plus 1 instead of i. And so in the, uh, the proceeding as before, we get a relation for the generating functions of GI with GI minus one, GI and GI plus one, from which G, the GI minus one can be expressed as a function of GI and GI plus one. And then we use induction to uh, express G, GI plus one as a function of GI. And finally, we relate just GI with GI minus one. Please change slide. So uh, we'll do it for i equal to n minus 1. What we we'll need to do is in the expression that we have in the, of gn minus 2 expressed as a function of gn minus 1 and gn, uh, substituting gn by a function of gn minus 1, and we get gn minus 1 expressed as a function of gn minus 2 multiplied by this function theta n minus 1. Please change slide. We'll do the same for i equal to n minus 1 and get a, a relation between gn minus 2 and gn minus 3. Please change slide. And, uh, and the, 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 do the same for uh, i equal to n minus 3, getting gn minus 3 expressed as a function of gn minus 4 and so on. So please change slide. 
So now we can get the algorithm where we start with uh, uh, computing theta n, then going uh, uh, backwards, compute theta i from theta i plus one, and then initialize g1 equal to theta one, and going now in a forward fashion, recursively computing g i from g i minus one and theta i. And then we'll do output all the values of the, the GIs from one to n. Please change slide. So as an illustration, we have here the table of values of the probably uh, function of S1 L1 in MM1 S7 uh, systems with the unit A uh, service rate and increasing blocking probabilities for on top with the traffic intensity uh, 0.5 and on bottom with traffic intensity 1.1. We see that the probability that at most the customers are served and the customers are lost is greater in the, serb, in the system with the uh, smaller service rate. Please change slide. And finally, to end, uh, we, we have here a graph where we have the same probability expressed as a function of traffic intensity for the three uh, customer acceptance uh, policies that we have defined. We see that the probability decreases with the traffic intensity and uh, that it is smaller for the system with the green which is the system with the partial blocking, then for the system in blue, which is the system with increasing blocking probabilities, and finally for the system in uh, purple, which is the system with decreasing blocking probabilities. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Antonio, and sorry for uh, these problems with the online situations. Uh, I ask if uh, anyone have a question or suggestions for this this work this work this presentation. If somebody, if somebody yes. I have uh, an inch and raising up. Who wants to talk? I think it was my microphone. I was setting back uh, the volume. <laughs> okay. Any any questions? Anyone want uh, to put one question to Antonio? I saw something. Uh, liking in the middle of my screen but i don't know if somebody want to to talk so uh i want to thank once again to antonio for this uh, uh fast presentation and uh, illustrative of your work thanks again for your presence and we'll uh, proceed for sandra if you don't mind, if you, somebody has questions, you can share uh, in Riot platform, for example. I'm uh, I'm Sandra, trying, I'm trying to uh, to share my my. You have you have changed to Chrome. Uh, yes, yes, I changed to Chrome because um, I have a lot of problems. So I, try to share your screen. Open uh, your presentation. Okay, it's open, but uh, I'm trying. And try to press the button on the left side. Share your screen. Okay, um, but it says uh, when it, uh, the, the button uh, to share is is not uh, okay. To is it, it doesn't function. <laughs> okay, I try to do it. I'm, I'm going to try again. Um, 
Okay. I don't know if I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to share, but it's impossible, I, I think. Uh, stop sharing. I try to share with Mike if it is possible. I'm. Uh, but it's it's a, a little bit complicated because my presentation is it's in parts, and I have to to click. Wait a moment. Ah, I I, I think I can share. All right, you have already sharing. I don't know. Do you see my my? Yes, I see my picture in the uh, great plan in your screen. You can share your presentation now, please. Um, I think open. I think it's okay. No, it's you in the screen. And now open. I have opened already my my presentation. You don't see it. We don't see anything. Oh, I'm sorry because I I, I try using my right. Maybe it's better. But I don't know if I'm sharing. Okay, I think. You saw your presentation? Yes. If you don't mind, you can uh, press. Here? Okay. So I start with uh, when you are. I'm ready. You can. You yes. Yes. I so can. let's proceed. Um, I'm going to present some simulation study to compare the performance of sine plots and sine mode generalized weight coefficients. Um, uh, this is a joint one, uh, joint work with Julia Tells. Can you pass, please? Um, I'm going to make a brief introduction, and after that, I'm going to present the coefficients to measure agreement among several sets of ranks, the candle coefficient and the and three, uh, three weighted coefficients. After that, I'm going to design the simulation study and, um, and present the simulation study results and uh, uh, some conclusions in the end. Uh, in 2008, the authors uh, had, uh, proposed two coefficients uh, to measure um, two, uh, be, uh, the, the, the correlation between two pairs of uh, ranks uh, that allowed to give more weight to the lower and upper ranks. And this index were obtained computing the Pearson correlation with the modified class and modifying mood scores. And this, in the sequel of this work in 2019, uh, we deduced the two new generalized coefficients, the sign class one and the sign mood, to measure the concordance among several sets of ranks, putting emphasis on the stream ranks. And the further one, the, the weighted coefficients, um, presented by Ajak and Sidak could also be included in these generalized coefficients. Um, uh, okay, you can we can move on. You can okay. This study aims to extend the last work uh, that we made in 2019, performing a simulation study to assess the behavior of the new coefficients. Uh, and the goal uh, in this work is uh, to make a comparison uh, of the four coefficients, the three weight coefficients and the, with the candle coefficients that attributes equal weights to all rankings. Uh, please press. And this comparison is made through the implementation of a simulation study using the Monte Carlo method, as usual. Can you pass, please? Okay. In this simulation, as I said before, we compared the four coefficients. Uh, please, uh, please pass. Okay. And so we will state the general expression of these coefficients and their asymptotic distributions, since they are necessary to carry out the Monte Carlo simulation study. And to present these coefficients, we are going to consider n subjects uh, to be ranked by m independent observers, and we consider that R I J is uh, representing the rank assigned to the subject J uh, by the observer I. Can you pass, please? 
the candles coefficient, and as many of you I know, is the ratio between the variance of the sum of the ranks assigned to the subjects and the maximum uh, possible value reached for the variance of the sum of the rankings, taking into account the values of n and m, uh, which is given by this expression. The value uh, S uh, is when uh, there is a total agreement among the ranks, and we can represent the Rj by the sum of ranks assigned to, to the subject J, and we can see that the candle coefficient of concordance give, is given by this expression. Please pass. Uh, and uh, this uh, coefficient takes values in the interval between 0 and 1. Can you pass, please? Although, although this coefficient is normally used as a, a measure of agreement among rankings, it could also be used as a test statistics, and there is a relationship between W and uh, Friedman uh, key square R statistics, which has an approximate key square distribution with N, N minus one degrees of freedom. Please pass. We can see considered we can consider an as uh, S I J. Uh, score, the generic score, can be the Van der Waarden, the Sun Clocks, and the Sun Mood score. Um, please, please pass. This generic score, um, are, uh, for this generic score, we can um, have the following equalities. Well, I note that uh, CS is a non-null non constant that depends on the sample size and the scores SIJ. Please pass. And um, uh, uh, can you pass, please, the, the other slide? Okay. In 2019, the authors proposed two new weight concordance coefficients built similarly to the Kendall's coefficient of concordance. And these new coefficients, as well as the, the Van der Waarden coefficient, are based on the ratio between the variance uh, of the sums, uh, of the n sums of m scores awarding to uh, subjects denoted by s square s s. And the maximum value of this variance um, can attain considering the values of n and m. So the weighted coefficients can, can uh, of, agreement, of agreement to measure the concordance among m set of ranks, uh, giving uh, more weight to the extreme ones, can be defined as you see in the slide. And um, uh, attending that we have the s bar uh, point points equal to zero then we can consider the S square S as given by this expression. And therefore, uh, in, the, in the making some calculus that you can see in the previous work of the, the last year, in the last year, the weighted coefficient to measure the concordance among M sets of ranks, putting emphasis on the extreme ones, can be given by the general expression given in the slide. And these coefficients take values between 0 and 1. Please pass. Uh, similarly to Kendall's coefficient, uh, these three weighted coefficients can be used uh, as well as test statistics. And their asymptotic distribution was postulated in a theorem uh, proved in the previous work, uh, which states that under the null hypothesis, no agreement or no association among the rankings, the statistics M. Uh, plus uh, n minus one plus a s as an asymptotic key square distribution with n, n minus one degrees of freedom. Uh, so with using R, we we perform a Monte Carlo simu simulation to compare the four coefficients. And uh, please pass. Um, and uh, and uh, this, this uh, the, to simplify from now on, we will refer. To the proportion of reject null hypothesis when testing whether the underlying population concordant coefficient is higher than zero by the power of the coefficient. This main objective of the simulation study is to contrast the virtue of each one of the three coefficient coefficients um, uh, that weight more, um, more, that give more emphasis to the lower and upper ranks um, when compared with the candle one. Um, please pass. And the data generation scheme was briefly the, the, the following. Um, is, is, is similar to the, the Legendre, Legendre uh, um, one, which is postulated in 2005. 
the first group of observations was produced to the generation of an n-dimensional vector of standard random normal deviations, and each one of the other groups um, uh, for some, some of n observations for some proportion when p is is uh, between zero and zero point five and choosing choosing an appropriate and standard deviation sigma uh, um, is made uh, in the following way uh, we uh, random normal deviations with zero mean and standard deviation sigma were added to the observation with the most extreme ranks in the first group and it, a random normal deviation with zero mean and standard deviation sigma were generating for the observations with in, intermediated ranks and the, the M set of observations were converted into M set of ranks, which are the related samples that we were considered. Please, Beth. Um, Sandra, just thank, uh, you have uh, eight minutes Oh, uh, already. So maybe it's better to pass to the conclusions, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I think it's it's better because I I don't have time. I in the first time I I thought is so uh, um, uh, that uh, it, uh, yes yes uh, uh, more uh, a little bit more please uh, yes uh, uh, it's better. Um, uh, I I'm sorry because in first time I don't uh, see that the presentation is only eight minutes, so I I only take some conclusions. And if you have doubts, you can uh, contact me by my email, and I uh, I have all the pleasure to explain to you the performance of the three generalized weight agreement coefficients to measure the concordance among several sets of ranks, putting emphasis on the extreme ranks was compared with behavior of the candles coefficients uh, that assigns equal weights in order to assess whether generalized weight agreements coefficients expects especially the ones that uh, we present uh, the new ones the sign plots and the sign mood coefficients can be a benefit in assessing the concordance among se several sets of ranks when one intends to place more emphasis on lower and upper ranks simultaneously um, and because of that, a Monte Carlo simulation study was carried out. And the simulation study allowed to show interesting results. All the coefficients in study, uh, um, the, three ones, the three new ones and the non-white show a better performance when the agreement is focused on a higher proportion of extreme ranks than when in, it's located on a smaller proportion. The, uh, the behavior of all coefficients is better for higher degrees of agreement compared to the small ones for both proportion of extreme ranks under study and for all, all the number of judges considered. And for a fixed number of subjects and in intensity of agreement, the powers of the four coefficients increase as the number of judges increases. So when it is important to give relevance to the agreement of lower and upper ranks at the same time, um, then one of the three generalized uh, new one, uh, the generalized weighted agreement coefficient should be used in test of the candles one. And the choice of one of the three types of generalized weighted agreements depends on the amount of extreme ranks that are on focus at the fo uh, are the focus of the assessment. In the case where the concordant was focused on the lower proportion of extreme ranks, the plots. The coefficient shows the best performance when compared with the other weight, where there were the other two weight, weighted coefficients. But on the contrary, the clothes coefficient is the worst where the agreement, when the agreement is located in a higher proportion of extreme ranks, being in that case the Sun Mood and the Van der Waarden coefficient, the ones that reveal the best performance in this case. And in both scenarios, the sign mood and the van der Waarden coefficient pre pre present quite similar powers to the several intensity of agreements considered for a fixed number of subjects and a fixed number of judges. And we believe that this simulation study helped to understand the profits that can result from the use of this generalized weighted coefficient of agreement in test of the candles one. In this situation where we it is intended to weight the streaming ranks simultaneously. Thank you, and uh, I'm sorry that I can't uh, uh, say more. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Uh, we have no time for questions. If uh, someone has questions, I appreciate that uh, contact you.
Okay. So we you. we proceed. Thank you again for the, your presentation and sorry for some kind of problems. Uh, we proceed to Karina with the communication impact of OVL variation on AUC bias estimated by non-parametric methods. Karina, are you ready? Yes, I'm going to try to share my screen. Thank you. Okay. Try if it is possible. <laughs> You are using Chrome? Yes. Yes. I'm it's, sharing. Yeah. Yes, it's possible. You have many screens. No, no, <laughs> no worry. <laughs> are you seeing the yes, you are seeing your yes. presentation? You can start now. Okay. So thank you. This is a joint work with uh, Antonia Turkman and Lizette Souza. I will start to explain a little bit and very briefly what is OVL and AUC. So receiver operating characteristic curves, uh, ROC curves, evaluates the accuracy of a binary system classification and it will reflect the relationship between sensitivity and one minus specificity. The area under the rock curve, you see, is a global index of accuracy, ranges between 0.5 and 1, and how much close of 1 it is, uh, it means that the classifier has a better performance. So overlapping coefficient, it measures the overlapping area between two probability densities when they are plots on the same axis and ranges between 0 and 1. So how much close to 1, it means that you have a distribution very similar. So the relationship between OVL and AUC, as you can see, if we have a low OVL, it means do you have a separated distributions in the rock um, context mean do you that you have um, a good performance of your classifier so you will get an AUC uh, close to to one so low OVL high AUC but when you have um, continuous distribution you need a classification rule to get the binary binary classification so uh, usually high values of the um, classification system means that you have a high probability uh, to have the artifact of interest. For instance, you have uh, a disease. So, however, if uh, low values means that you have a high probability to have the artifact of interest, but you do not change the classification rule, you will get um, a rock curve completely below of that reference line, meaning that you have a not proper rock curve. But in, um, for instance, in uh, genetic studies, this is a very interesting uh, property because you can identify genes with uh, hyperregulated expression or uh, genes with down-regulated expression. So in this, in this study, we will consider AUC values ranging between 0 and 1. So in that case, when you have um, low uh, values for the overlapping coefficient, uh, you can get uh, AUC values close to 1. But you can have other scenarios. For instance, if you have a, a OVL close to 1, meaning that the both distributions are um, overlapped, you will have a AUC close to 0 0.5, meaning that your rock curve uh, is close to that reference line and you have a poor performance of your classifier. However, uh, because we are considering that the UC can range between 0 and 1, we can see other situations, for instance, that one. When you have um, similar mean values, however, with different branches, you will have a low OVL, but you will get um, a sigmoidal rock curve crossing that reference line, meaning that you have a not proper rock curve. 
And in this situation, this is a very particular situation in genetic uh, studies, for instance, because you have um, mean values very close. However, you have a bimodal situation, a bimodal distribution, meaning that you have a mixture of population. For instance, in cancer research is very interesting because you can identify subtypes of cancer. And you also get a sigmoidal rock curve. So if you just want to use rock analysis to identify those kind of genes, it is not possible. However, when you plot OVL against AUC, you can see those different scenarios, considering low OVL because you, you have different uh, uh, distributions. And here you can see upregulated genes, down here, down regulated, and there you can find those special genes. So that's why we are uh, interesting in the analyze the behavior of the bias of AUC when we variate the OVL values. So our simulation study relies, of course, on the Monte Carlo method, and we consider several kinds of distribution trying to, to uh, describe different uh, um, thickness, different skewness, and so on. We fixed the OVL on the values between on 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and 8. We just consider AUC values uh, higher than uh, 0 0.5 because, as you can see, we have a symmetry between there, so it is not necessary to uh, consider all values between 0 and 1. So we consider binormal uh, distributions with fixed mean value, meaning that you can get not proper rock curves. We consider also binormal uh, distribution with fixed variances by log normal distributions and by exponential. For non parametric estimation of AUC, we consider the empirical one, the Gaussian kernel, but we considered three bandwidth methods. Uh, the Silverman method, when we have a Gaussian kernel, it is what it is proposed. However, if you have bimodal distribution or multimodal distribution, Scott proposed another bandwidth. And uh, another one, it is the plug-in solve the equation method. This is a particular um, method of plug-in methods. And this is uh, considered a good method with a good performance. So after uh, uh, our all, we have four non-parametric uh, approaches. So for all those distributions that I, I, I talked before, for four uh, values of OVL, we considered uh, sample dimensions of 15, 30, 50, and 100. And for the four mm, non permethrin methods, methods uh, we uh, get a bootstrap estimates with 1,000 replicates. And we get estimates, bootstrap estimates for AUC, uh, bootstrap estimates for um, AUC bias, standard error, and root mean uh, square error. After all, we had a total of 1,024 estimates. So to see the behavior of those estimates, we plotted them and put the OVL on the X uh, axis. And uh, in that situation, we observed the AUC um, estimate and um, the horizontal lines represent the true values of AUC and this first plot represents the uh, not proper rock curves when you have a AUC around uh, 0 0.5 and as you can see the OVL no matter what, what the value the, the estimates had a similar behavior of course if you have high values of your samples you will Excuse get me. we are out of time uh sorry okay um i don't know did i uh you have one minute to finish okay yes. okay so um, 
after all, what we want to see if the, the AUC uh, AUC bias, you can see that uh, uh, the AUC bias uh, considering um, values lower than the 0 0.2, so this is a um, not very high bias. However, we can see that the behavior for uh, high uh, values of OVL, we will get uh, higher bias. So, uh, in conclusions, um, for low values of OVL, we have a higher precision. However, we found that when we have uh, not proper rock curves, meaning that it uh, represent the special genes, you will have um, a low uh, uh, precision of AUC. So for the future, we are considering uh, a mixture distributions and discrete distributions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Karina, for your attention, you. for your presentation work. And uh, if you, someone have questions, you reserve uh, a chat in an IOT room to share with all participants in this session. Uh, we proceed for the last uh, presentation. Francisco. Hello. Hello, you are uh, ready to share your screen? Uh, yeah, I think so. So uh, let me just get to it. Can you see it? Yes. Let's proceed. Is, you can is, start. This, uh, is it full screen right now? Yes, yes, you can so, proceed. Okay, I know, I, I know we're pressed for time. So, hello everyone. Uh, I am Francisco and I will be presenting my paper on adjusting rock curve for covariates with the AROC R package. Um, this uh, paper is essentially an exploration of this new R uh, package, uh, AROC. Uh, we wanted to see uh, how it works with real data and its uh, limitations. So for context, uh, fortunately, I don't need to go too much in depth since my uh, colleague already went into it. But uh, obviously, medical testing is defined by the ability to differentiate between diseased and non-diseased individuals. And rock curves are very popular for this for obvious reasons. Uh, however, there are uh, underlying characteristics, uh, which we can refer to as covariates, that uh, can confound the analysis. Uh, so it's important to integrate them, these covariates, into these studies to avoid biases. This is where the AROC comes in. It's a relatively new method uh, of covariate incorporation. And because it's a newer method, it has uh, a few... Uh, less than would be ideal uh, computational methods available. And this is where the R package comes in. Uh, the AROC R pack package, it has the same name as the method, uh, was uh, constructed by Maria Jose Rodriguez Alvarez and uh, Van Dinacio Carvalho. Um, and uh, I could probably spend uh, a few presentations talking about each of these methods specifically. Uh, but uh, on a, uh, sorry, summarizing, it has four methods of analyzing the AROC, plus a few uh, extra methods for predictive checks, post-predictive che uh, checks, and uh, pull drop curve. So uh, as to our methodology, we use data from the Portuguese National Registry for low uh, weight newborns. This is because uh, it had two uh, good covariate candidates, one being the biological sex of the infant and the other being the age of the mother, which uh, have uh, obviously different natures. One is continuous and the other one is uh, categorical. Uh, we tried to adjust the CRIP scores, which are scores to predict mortality in this case, to see if there was any biases associated with uh, any of these covariates using the methods uh, we've talked about here. So, uh, for results now. We, uh, uh, first, we uh, tried and see if there was any possible deviation between methods. You can see uh, this is the 
a rock curves adjusted for the mother's age, and this is for the, the sex, sex adjusted. Uh, we superimposed each method with a controlled uh, empirical pulled rock curve in each case, uh, and with no uh, significant differences. Uh, afterwards, we saw uh, the, we studied the different summaries provided by each of these methods. Uh, you can see on the top, this is the, the standard summary indicators for, for the rocks, so it's pretty much just uh, uh, an AUC value with uh, confidence intervals. However, uh, in the SP method, the frequentist uh, method, uh, you can see a, a larger and more precise uh, summary index with uh, alpha values and whatnot. Uh, finally, uh, sorry, not finally. Um, we also tried to see if uh, there were any differences between the estimation of the pulled rock curves. They have different methods. One is a Bayesian, uh, and the other one is an empirical uh, estimation uh, with no uh, differences whatsoever. You can see there's a huge overlap on uh, with the confidence intervals. Uh, and finally, we try and see how the, um, the Bayesian methods behaved using our uh, real data. Uh, we, we did this using the, the post-predictive checks uh, provided by the package. You can see that the Bayesian semi parametric uh, did not behave uh, that well, at least compared to the, the, the full non parametric uh, version, which has a which had a good simulation. Oh, sorry, I went a bit ahead. So, uh, in summary, uh, all AROC estimation methods uh, could handle both uh, categorical and um, uh, sorry, categorical and continuous uh, covariates. Uh, a rock SP, which is, is which is the frequentist method, was definitely the fastest, and it was the most informative of this of these methods. The the PPCs offer a, a great insight uh, on their uh, on the behavior of each of the methods, and uh, it's an extra addition to the package, which I found uh, amazing. Uh, the pulled rock methods uh, have obviously uh, the standard behaviors that you would expect and uh, the smaller differences you can find on the AUC values and on the rock curves themselves is the nature of their estimators and nothing else. So they're pretty reliable. Uh, and the results showed no st uh, statistical uh, differences uh, for the biological sex in the CRIP score. Uh, so, in closing, uh, for this package, uh, it grants multiple methods of analysis and estimation of the A rock curve. Methods can handle both categorical and continuous covariates. All methods generate uh, A rock curves with seemingly no statistical differences. And uh, what's best is that uh, any R user can now conduct a more thorough uh, rock and A rock uh, analysis. Finally, regarding our data, uh, there is now a possibility for further research on possible uh, confounding covariates that will enable us to enhance the, the CRIP score. So, uh, special thanks, obviously, to the Portuguese National Registry for providing the, the data, to the FCT for funding, and uh, you for listening. That's my presentation. Thank you, Francisco. You finished just in time. We yeah. <laughs> have a limit of the time. I think I have no possibility to make uh, some questions or answers. And uh, if somebody wants to, to put one question to Francisco, only one. So. Uh, we need to finish this session. Thank you again to all participants and to all, all speakers to do this effort to in the time. All right, we proceed yeah. to the second session. Frederic, uh, you are here? Yes, I am here. Uh, okay. And uh, I think I changed my role with Umberto. Hi, Umberto. 
Hi there. Yes, uh, in Humberto is the next chair. Uh, I changed. Uh, remember, I changed my role. The, uh, submit uh, the validation of paper. Have you the link? What? Uh, Sorry. There is uh, a submission of the validation of paper. Uh, you should receive the, the link uh, via mail, but uh, if you have yes. not, uh, I can send you. Yes, Benjamin will send the, um, the form for us to, to fill in. Yes, the form. I can send the you. Yes, I, I have the, the now I have no time, I feel a posteriori. So we need to start, Umbert? Yes, please. Okay, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Let's try to keep this nice and smooth, um, trying to avoid computer issues. And this is the second session of computational and applied statistics. And we will have four presentations. The first one is Ana Cristina Braga. The second one is Isabel Dimas. The third one is Francisca Monteiro. And the last one is Ana Rita Antunes. Is everybody here? Yes, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Ana Cristina, Hello, is Francisca here? Francisca? No, is I Ana Rita? Not. Yes, I'm here. Okay, so um, we are two minutes behind schedule, so I, I think we should start and Francisca eventually will show up. Enter. Um, the first presenter is actually the workshop share, is... <laughs> Ana Cristina Braga, and uh, she already managed. Share. And, I will uh, try to share my presentation on the screen. Yes, I already see it. And um, Ana Cristina will present a uh, rosy application for selecting R packages that perform rock analysis. Um, go ahead, Ana Cristina. So I'm sharing the screen. All right. You have seen my presentation now? Yes. So, good morning to everybody. I try to keep uh, in, te in eight minutes uh, the presentation of this work. And uh, the, as the title said, I try to present one application for selecting our package that perform ROC analysis. This is a joint work of uh, José Pedro Quintas, a student, Francisco Costa, the previous speakers, and me. So the outline of this presentation is divided in four main parts. A uh, brief introduction is uh, relevant because the previous speakers already talk about the importance of ROC analysis. Uh, then I define the criteria for our, our package selected, uh, the data set and the flowchart to construct the Shine application. A little bit of explication about the, the Shiny. And uh, finally, I tried to, to perform a demonstration of this application online. So the ROC analysis, as you know, is a great uh, uh, tool and they have a great efficiency of performance. And uh, Every, as the, the main areas of actuation as the medicine, medical diagnosis and in uh, most recently in machine learning, data mining and others. Uh, the, great in, the increasing of the needs of using this kind of analysis uh, is the needs the, to, to have many softwares available to fulfill to perform the computations. So uh, we need to evaluate uh, this uh, kind of analysis in a short period of time. And uh, this, this kind of analysis simply, but we need to, uh, to have one tool to perform or what, which tool to select to perform this kind of analysis. This is a graph. Uh, the ROC graph that you have already seen. I focus on uh, empirical ROC curves and adjusted curve too. And we choose the R working environment because they offer a, a different kind of package that will be able to compute this kind of uh, analysis. What about R? Everyone knows R is a platform available and is free 
and is almost uh, used for the community, community of statisticians. It's free access and is working in a common line. They use it package for uh, compute uh, uh, ROC analysis is listed here and the criteria use it was based on some uh, previous publication according the availability of the package in the R platform. So, uh, using this information, we construct a proposed checklist based on the criteria and in each package with one data set, uh, a common data set, to evaluate uh, if uh, each one fulfilled the, re, uh, the this criteria. As you can see, in general view, uh, the PROC is the package that fulfill all conditions created in this checklist. Uh, and uh, as you can see to the comp to rock here in the middle of the this table, uh, almost fulfill all criteria too. So proceed to to the aim uh, of the Chinese application in this work after an export exploratory part that allowed the creation of these checklists. Uh, we tried to create an application that would be a function, a kind of library of air package to compute ROC analysis that the user can can uh, use in our days. So uh, this is the most common uh, 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 scheme of uh, Shiny application. We have uh, two different scripts, the UER and the server R. In the UE we have all concentrated the visual aspects of the applications, just like the widgets. And uh, in the server, we have all the remain part with interactive instructions function with the first one. The application is the result of these two kind of, uh, of, uh, of scripts. So, to, com to, to construct this application, I have put here the name, and the name is the result of check the words ROC curve, ROC analysis, and shiny application, and we choose the name ROSI for this project. So we we construct the checklist and we present this checklist to the user as a to function of the selection the best package to use in my problem. So we need to divide this, uh, this project into, into different uh, kind of upload data frame because the comp to rock package have different prerequisites to compute, to upload the data. And uh, so we divide using the information of each package. So, and the needs to compare two curves or project only one curve. Uh, so here we have the, the name of the application. The application is available in a where, where are, oh, a link here, available in this uh, link. And now, uh, if you, you see, we have the first screenshot of the application. And now I proceed to to demonstration of uh, some features of this application. Uh, this is the logo type. You have seen the, the open OER, yes, in your screens. You see the application? Yes, but you have yes. one, two minutes, OK? Yes. Yes, yes, only to demonstrate. Here you have the user guide. Uh, you have the right directly to the CRAN for each package. And uh, I go to upload only one file to see how this works. And for example, this one is available. And uh, we select, here we have five uh, different variables 
five different index to compare and the result. And if I want to project only one curve, I select the package. If I select the PRO, ROC, I have here the directly the results. If I want to smooth the curve, this most if i want to add for example a value of partial area the result is showing directly in the graph and if i want to add a new curve for this for example the weighted for the the new borns i had uh, directly in this one if i want to compare to curves only the proc uh, have this kind of uh, procedures and you have this interactive menu if i want to choose come to rock only to to see the difference the same data set i have to project the data here i need to write the name of the for example the predictors and i choose this one because this direction needs to be changed because uh, they differ. And the result, if I want, I have dependent results. I know this data set and I need to run. I have almost 30 seconds to produce the output. In uh, conclusions, I change, I only to see the result of this is almost there. I think I have one, mi one minute. E here you have the results. So I go to finish my presentation here. And uh, as conclusions, uh, we try in this work explore several R packages that perform the ROC analysis using uh, ROC curves. Uh, we built the checklist and we try to grade this checklist and we construct the final product, the Shine application. As a future work, uh, have many things could be done as uh, add new tools to the application, keep the results up to date, bug fix and useless of application in different areas. So thank you for your attention. I try to keep my 10 minutes, right? I finish. Uh, almost right. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you have a nice feature here in uh, Jitsi, which is a speaker stats, and you can check if you fulfill your time or not, which is not the case here. Um, yes. It's I've... a very nice uh, job and presentation. It's always nice to have someone else to implement our packages for us to use. Um, if you have any questions, you can use the asynchronous platform, uh, Riot, uh, to interact with the, with the authors. Thank you again, and we Thank have to you. move on to the next one, which is Isabel. Isabel, go on. Try to share you. your screen. Hello, Hello I'm, I will try to share the screen. I'm sharing the screen. Yes, we can see it. OK, it's perfect. Yes. Um, Okay, okay, Isabel is going to present the PLS uh, visualization using MyPlots, an application to team effectiveness. Go ahead, you have eight minutes. So, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, of presenting this work, which is the result of a joint work with Alberto Silva and Adelaide Freitas from the University of Aveiro and Paul Renato Lourenço and Teresa Rebelo from the University of Coimbra as myself. So here we have the outline of my presentation. First, I'm going to present the objectives of uh, the present study. Then I will present the methods that we implemented. I will present then the results that we have found. Uh, and finally, I will discuss these results and I will, I will give some conclusions. The primary purpose of this research is to provide a straightforward interpretation for the PLES biplot applicable to both exploratory and predictive purposes. And we are going to illustrate it using a team effectiveness research data. 
When predictors are many and quasi-collinear, PLES regression tends to give better results than OLES regression since it eliminates the quasi-collinearity issue. The PLES method extracts factors that maximize the covariance between the predictors and the response variables, and then regresses the response on these latent factors. So based on the outputs of the PLES, we can build an exploratory PLES biplot, which represents the variances and the correlations of variables. And we can also build a predictive PLES biplot which provides a visual approximation of the PLES coefficient estimates. So the method that we used was the biplot, and here we have the equation for the exploratory biplot, in which each individual is represented as a biplot point, and each predictor and response variable is represented as a biplot vector. In the predictive biplot, each regression is represented as a vector in the predictor subspace. We are going to implement uh, this method in a database, in a data set of teams, of organizational teams. And we are going to study team effectiveness since it's one of the most important criteria in terms of uh, the functioning of teams. Because team effectiveness is a multidimensional construct, we will focus on two criteria, team performance, which is our response Y1, and the quality of the group experience, which is our second response. So considering the predictors that we will consider in this study, we will consider 13 predictors, which represents different aspects of the team functioning. I will not go through this, but I can go back if you want. We conducted a quantitative study with a cross-sectional design and surveys were collected from 104 work groups and their respective leaders. And after eliminating from the sample uh, the, the teams were with a response rate less than 50%, the remaining sample get, um, is composed of 82 teams with six members on average. Team leaders were surveyed about team performance, whereas team members were surveyed about the 14 remaining variables. So here we have the scales that we use to measure the variables. I will not go through this in detail, but I would like to highlight that all scales are pre-validated scales. Also, we use the average of the teams um, to compute the variables. Uh, moving on to the results, uh, first the predictor matrix and the response matrix were centered and scaled, and next the NIPALS algorithm was used to decompose the data matrices and to extract two PLES components. So table one gives the uh, estimates of the PLES regression co coefficients. So as you can see, in terms of the team performance response, uh, the most significant predictors were team efficacy and team optimism. Also, uh, task, uh, team psychological safety, which is... Uh, be behind this, this uh, image that is here. Um, concerning the quality of the group experience, the most significant predators uh, were uh, team trust and team cohesion, the both, both dimensions of team, cohe team cohesion, and in a negative way, also both dimensions of intergroup conflict. So here we have in this figure the exploratory PLES biplot. Uh, each, each black point um, represents the 82 teams and the red uh, vectors uh, represent the predictors, while the red um, biplot, the, sorry, the blue uh, biplot vectors represents the responses, the two responses. So each, uh, the two components explains approximately 66% of the variance. Figure two uh, shows the results of the predictive biplot method. Uh, in this case, the larger the area of the triangle, the larger will be the impact of the variable on the response. So with respect to response team performance, which is represented in the left biplot, the predictor, so here, the predictors, team efficacy, this one, team optimism, and team psychological safety, 
this one, stand out as the most, the most influential variables to the model since the triangle related to the regression coefficients B3, B4, and B11 showed the most significant area. Further, the predictor uh, X3, X13, which is, uh, which is social cohesion, affects team performance negatively, given that the triangle uh, is on the right side of the um, by plot axis. Regarding the response quality of the group experience, which is this graph, um, the right but the most important predictors are, uh, as you can see, uh, these two, which are intergroup conflict, task, and, uh, and effective, and they are affecting in a negative way uh, our response, and um, also team trust, which is here, and uh, X12, uh, which is this one. Um, so uh, we can we can easily reach this, this, the same conclusions um, by looking at table two, and so they, they go in the same uh, um, sense. Um, in this in this uh, graph, we have the uh, a modified version of the exploratory PLES biplot in which all of the biplot vectors are projected onto the calibrated biplot axis. In this case, in team performance. So the angle between two vectors approximates the correlation between the two variables. So once again, the most significant vector projection, projection sorry, refer to X3, X4, and X11. So Isabel, you have two minutes to finish, okay? Okay, thank you. So um, figure show four concerns the quality of the group experience and the results are similar to the results of the area by plot method. So I'm not going to analyze it in detail. So um, to conclude, overall, the most significant results found in our study suggest relationships between the predictors and the criteria that are convergent with the literature. Indeed, the interpretation method proposed provided excellent results on the application considered. Nevertheless, some minor inconsistencies were detected, uh, namely concerning the weight of some projections of the biplot vectors. Uh, however, it is important to highlight that biplot is a visualization method whose, whose purpose is to provide a general idea of flattened structures in the data. But thank you very much for your attention and keep safe. Thank you, Isabel. Um, we are still a little bit behind time. Uh, it was a very nice presentation. It's a very nice tool of uh, visualization of different variables. Um, I have only one question. Um, can you go a little bit back uh, until one of the pictures of, not this one, the one that displays the arrows? Um, does these uh, arrows um, that represent each of the variables, the, the size of the vectors correspond to something? I, I didn't understand that. Uh, yes, the, the size corresponds to the variance, uh, specifically are uh, okay. related to the standard deviation of the variable. Okay, um, thank you again. If you have any questions, you can use the synchronous platform to, to interact with the, the authors. And we will move on to the next presenter. I see that Francisca is already. Thank you very much. And thank you. Keep safe. Uh, Francisca, hi. Can you try to share your presentation? You need to open it first and then try to share it. We cannot hear you because your microphone. You need to turn it on. Also, your image. She's not here, I think. The connection but is lost. But she is. Uh, I, I but the connection is lost. Oh, OK. Um, I can I start know. if you want. And the next one? 
Yes, I don't know exactly the protocol, but I think um, because we are a little bit behind schedule, we will change the fourth and third um, presentation. And Ana Rita, if you want, you can try to share your presentation. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. You can see now? Um, uh, try. Uh, we are seeing exactly what you are seeing, but it's not the best uh, feature for yeah. us. Try, try to um, put in presentation only. mode. One Maybe. screen only. Oh, what is that? Now you, you can right. see, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, Anna Rita is the next presenter, and she will present a tiny app to predict agricultural uh, tire dimensions. Go ahead. You have eight minutes. Hello. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna, and my article is about the shiny app to predict agricultural tire dimensions, and it was developed with Anna Braga. This project was carried out in industrial context, and the variables were called due to confidential agreements. I would like to give you a brief outline of my presentation. Firstly, I will start to introduce the problem. Secondly, I will explain the objectives for this project and thereafter I will show the results analysis. Next, I will uh, show you the Shiny application made and some conclusions. When uh, a company wants to produce a new tire, it's necessary to consider some specification. In this case, it's important to define the mold. This is the first step. The second is to define the material and the quantity of each dam. The third step is the tire production. And after that, the tire has to pass some tests. For example, dimensional or endurance tests. Endurance tests are used to test the tire duration. In this case, is in hours. Uh, the tire also have to all, uh, only pass the test if the results are in accordance with the legal norms where the maximum of dimensional and endurance values are defined. For this study, we only analyze dimensional tests because the company objectives so we we'll use 146 agricultural tires and 31 predictor variables, which four are qualitative and 27 are quantitative. We also have two response variables, A1 and A2, that are the values obtained in test one and test two. In this presentation, I will talk more about the application and review the results obtained. Here we can see the two response variables are quantitative too. This leads me to the objective of the project and consists in understanding the relationship between the variables, obtain linear regression models, and develop a web application to make it easier for the company to make prediction for test one and test two. The software used here was R. After the data analysis, principal components analysis was used to eliminate multicollinearity effects. And since the main objective is to build models that allow prediction for A1 and A2, we use the 27 principal com components and uh, the four, quali uh, four qualitative variables that I referred after, before. Multiple linear regression we use to predict test one and test two, since the variables response are quantitative and uh, all the symptoms were validated and there are five and four outliers for A1 and A2. Also, the multiple linear regression for test one and test two were obtained using stepwise and the model selection was made using AIC criteria. In my article, you can see all the results and discussion. Before creating the application, it was necessary to define the steps for its construction, which are represented here. The application has the purpose to do two things, upload data set. Here, the company has to select the CSV file. And the other thing is to predict. 
in this case, the, the application after insert all the values, the application standardize the values because they have different measures. After that, the principal components are calculated and the predictions are obtained. Like was said before, the tire has to pass the test and for this reason it's necessary to determine the maximum of each test. Here you, we can see the, the application. In this case, is the when the company wants to upload the data set. They have to search the folder and want a CSV file. Here we'll see an example I made and the company can search for the tire ID, for example, and they can see here the specification of the tire they want to make a prediction. The other option is to make predictions for test one and test two. They have to put all the values. If the variable is quantity, they have to insert the, the number and if it is qualitative, they have to choose the level intended. After inserts all the value, they have to click and go the bottom here, and the results appears. What we see here, the value for test one and the value for test two, and the results. In this case, the tire doesn't pass, and the company have to change some specifications and try again, make the prediction and see if the tire pass with this difference. By using the application, uh, it is possible to reduce the quantity of materials and research. And there is an increase in efficiency and profits since the application can predict the performance of the tire before starting its production. In addition, reducing the industrialization time is also an advantage because some specification can be cancelled before the production phase. It also helps to preserve the environment by reducing the destruction of tires with bad performance. Therefore, this application helps the user to select the best specification for the tire, thus generating more security in the specification to be used and uh, enable a reduction of errors by the, um, the research and development department. All the code for this application is also in my article and I explain uh, all steps I had to make. Thank you very much. I don't, if you have any question. Thank you, Ana Rita. Um, very nice job keeping within time. Um, I wonder if there is um, any concrete application, agriculture or culture application that you were uh, thinking while developing your um, code? No. no, this was a problem because the company um, don't make any calculation and uh, they have to produce the tire and see what is wrong and uh, they want to predict uh, and uh, I thought uh, to make this application to make it easier for them and they didn't have nothing uh, like this. Okay, very well. Um, we have time for a short question, if anyone. Okay, thank you again for your nice uh, presentation and let's try to see if Francisca is here. She was on and out during the last talk. I don't know if she managed to connect. And I'm not sure about the protocol either. I have already seen Francisca, but uh, some reason she left. I said the 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 browser Chrome is better. I perhaps she tried to change. I tried to communicate with her. Yes, um, 
she has um, a message here in the chat at 12.24, so she was here a little bit ago. I don't know if she has problems with the internet connection, I don't know. We will wait a couple more minutes, just trying to see if she may make it We will wait until 12.40. Yes. Then we'll if there are here. some problems, we can um, put Francisca in the third session of computation and applied statistics because we have only uh, two, two speakers. Okay. In the evening. Let's see. If she make, um, she, if she, she has problems sharing, she I, I, can, I, I have uh, here all the presentation, so I can try to share her presentation. And she tried. The connection is lost again, but she tried. I see the name here. Mm -hmm. In a few minutes, you have the open session, right? Yes. I was watching on YouTube the first session of this workshop, and it was a very... Oh, Francisca is now. Hi, Hi. Francisca. Hello. Finally, Hi. I could join the meeting. I had to change my, my computer, but now I can, I think. Okay, do you think you can um, share your presentation? Yes, I think so. Okay, go ahead. Open first the presentation, Francisca. Yeah, it's here. Yeah. Can you see my... Yes, perfect. Um, yeah. You, you can... Uh, uh, click Ocultar. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And um, go ahead. You okay. have eight minutes. Okay. Uh, first of all, sorry for this. I was not, I was not expecting. Can you please? So, hello everyone. It is a pleasure to be here presenting this work for, for all of the participants and audience of this conference. My name is Francisca Monteiro and I'm going to present um, a work that I've been developed with some members of my group in the Center for Microelectromechanical Systems in, uh, at the University of Ming in Guimarães, Portugal. So let's start. So starting uh, with a brief contextualization, uh, 360 nail stainless steel is widely used uh, in the automotive industry, namely in the manufacture of piston rings. These steels have high mechanical and corrosion resistance and high mecha mechanability. However, due to its low wear resistance, there has been a need to use hard particles to enhance its performance. In this sense, uh, we decided to use a metal matrix composite, which are known to improve the mechanical and tribological properties of the materials. The main goal of the project, oh, sorry. Yes, the main, oh, I don't know what is happening. Sorry, just a second. So uh, the main goal of this project was to develop a multi-material of a surface to improve wear behavior and performance of the steel. And particularly in this work, the aim was the statistical evaluation of the influence of the diamond particle size of the composites and also the influence of the type of technology used for the, um, the sintering process. 
So uh, moving on for the, um, the methodological procedure, we can see that the composite with diamond particles was sintered by two technologies, the laser sintering and the hot pressing. And for each type of technology, two diamond particle sizes were considered, so 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 and 40 to 60 micrometers. Now, the, produ the, pr the production process is systematically represented in this figure. Firstly, the stainless steel sample is texturized by laser and the pattern produced is filled by the composite uh, with diamond particles. Then this composite is densified inside the, the, um, the texture by one of the technologies that I already um, talked to you about. And the, re the result is Sintra, um, is a, an hybrid com concept, which is finally polished to remove the excess layer. Considering the, um, the statistical analysis performed in this work to evaluate the impact of each factor in the produced material, the following sample uh, was considered. Importantly, the software used for this evaluation was the EBM SPSCS software, and all the statistical analysis were, uh, was held for a significant level of 5%. In order to assess the wear behavior and performance of the sintry surfaces, uh, the following responses were were evaluated. So the coefficient, sorry, the coefficient of friction and the um, the wear uh, the specific wear rate. So now the statistical analysis performed in this work and the discussion of the main results are are now presented. So um, after the descriptive analysis of the data, the possible effect of time on the coefficient of friction was assessed. It was the, the first factor to be, to be assessed. So for this purpose, we, we uh, picked up five time points. Um, we interpolated them within the time range uh, uh, considered, and the samples were compared for uh, the exact same instance. Uh, our first attempt was the repeated measures ANOVA, which requires two main assumptions to be fulfilled. So the data must be normally distributed and, um, and uh, the sphericity of the data must be, must be verified, meaning that the, the variances of the differences between all combinations of factor of related groups uh, must be equal. So to check the previous assumptions, the kolmogorov smirnov test uh, and the Mokhlis tests were performed. Uh, again, considering a, a significant level of 5%, both assumptions were rejected, rejected. And for this reason, we had to resort to an alternative uh, solution. And of course, the most obvious one is a non-parametric test. So we decided to use the Friedman's test, which enables the, the assessment of the statistical significance of the difference between the mean ranks of the related groups. Uh, the statistic can be calculated using the formula that I present here. And we found that the employed treatments did not significantly affect the coefficient of, of friction over time. So next, we intended to study how the diamond particle size and the sintering technology affected the coefficient of friction. And our first idea was to use the ANOVA test with a two-factor factorial design. Again, for the application of this method, the respective assumptions must be satisfied. So starting with the normality assumption, starting with the normality assumption, the SPSCS software restored the histogram of the data and the results from the kolmogorov smirnov test, based on which we found that the coefficient of friction does not follow a normal distribution. And therefore, again, we had to resort to a non-parametric test. Looking at, looking at these box plots, you can see that the data presents different variabilities for each combination of factor, uh, mainly for the highlighted case. So uh, as we wanted to use a test that compares the distribution of two independent samples, we decided to choose um, the two sample kolmogorov smirnov test that examines whether the distribution of the data is the same ac across the two factor levels. And based on the applied test, we can say that the diamond particle sizes, sorry, here, uh, the diamond particle size uh, used in the sintering process produced a statistical a statistically significant impact in the coefficient of friction, whereas the type of technology did not affect this parameter in a significant statistical way. After 
After, in this new section, the goal was to test the influence of the same factors that we previously test, but this time in the specific wear rate. In order to analyze the effects of each factor and the interaction between them, this linear model was used. Again, the ANOVA method was our first choice to evaluate the significance of the effect of each factor, and this time the data verified both assumptions. By performing, by performing the ANOVA test, uh, we found that the interaction between uh, the size of the diamond particles and the type of technology affects the specific wear rate uh, variable. This interaction can be analyzed using the plot presented here. Yes. Francisca, you have two minutes, okay? Yes. Uh, so I was saying that, uh, as you can, uh, you have uh, we have a significant uh, in, a significant interaction between these factors, and additionally, we anal uh, analyzed the residuals, and we saw that some anomalies. Um, exist in, in the, the graph, the, the, the residuals plot that we have obtained. And uh, uh, we performed, uh, we tried to, to plot the, blo the box plot is to see if there is some dispersion that could uh, explain these results. And we saw that the non-satisfactory pattern um, uh, observed in the residuals plot may be due to this large dispersion mainly observed again for Oh, sorry. For the highlighted case. So basically, our final conclusion, and starting with the coefficient of friction, were that there was no significant effect of time on, on this, this variable. So this does not affect uh, significantly the coefficient of friction. And uh, the diamond particle size do impact uh, the, this variable while the the type of technology did not. Concerning the specific wear rate, we saw that uh, we obtained an adjusted model with an R squared of about 0 0.9. So we can say that this model uh, explained the factors and uh, the interaction between them. But as we have an interaction between between the um, the factors that we that we test, we have to be careful about the analysis of the main effects alone. So this is our work. I hope you are as excited as we do about this. And again, it was a pleasure to be here presenting this for you. I hope you have enjoyed my presentation. And sorry for all the trouble again this moment. So thank, thank you, you Francisca. Um, you. You're welcome. You don't have to excuse yourself. Uh, uh, it was a very nice presentation, but unfortunately, we have no time for questions. If any uh, of you have questions, uh, you can use the synchronous platform to interact with uh, this or the other or the previous authors. And this will end this second session of uh, computational and uh, um, applied statistics. Uh, I would like to remind you that in the afternoon, you will have the third se session. Um, I would like to congratulate all the authors that present in this session and in the previous one and to congratulate the workshop chair, Ana Cristina Braga, that can end this uh, session. Go ahead, Ana Cristina. <laughs> thank you. I want uh, public thanks to Umberto to carry this the job of, of uh, moderate one session of computation and applied mm -hmm. statistics. I want oh, thanks to, to all authors and participate participants in these sessions and we have the last session in the evening at uh, as scheduled in the timetable thank you again uh, and uh, i want to congratulate all of them good lunch bye 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 see you bye bye thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank you. A reminder for today, K7, at uh, 2 and 15 p.m. there is the opening ceremony. At uh, 3 o'clock there is the opening of keynote lecture. Or the links are on the website. Okay. 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 okay, thank you. See you. Bye-bye. See Bye -bye. you. Bye. No almost. <laughs> <laughs>